Good morning and afternoon. I am at large council member Anita Bonds, chairperson of the Committee on Housing and Executive Administration. The time is 12.04 p.m. on Wednesday, the 17th of March, 2021. We are meeting virtually via Zoom to convene a public oversight hearing on the District of Columbia Housing Authority. The purpose of today's hearing is to receive government witness testimony regarding the authority's performance in FY 20 and 21 to date. Today, this committee will conduct two separate oversight hearings on performance of the authority. In the first hearing, the Committee on Housing and Executive Administration will receive testimony from Director Garrett and ask questions about the overall performance of the authority. Immediately following that session at 3 p.m., the second hearing will commence, which will be a joint oversight hearing conducted with the Committee on Human Services. The hearing will pertain only to housing voucher and district um, Department of Human Services programs targeted to the homeless, which are administered by the District of Columbia Housing Authority in coordination with the Department of Human Services. Before we begin our first hearing, I'd like to reflect on the fact that one year ago today, the District um, Council unanimously passed the COVID-19 Response Emergency Amendment Act of 2020 that granted to the mayor the authority to address the critical needs of DC residents and businesses during a public health emergency. This legislation empowered the district government to respond to urgent and emergency needs. And I'm very proud that the legislation continues to guide our navigation of and recovery from the pandemic's effects. Sadly, we have lost um, more than 1,000 DC residents to the virus in the past year. At this time, please join me in dedicating a moment of silence in their memory. Thank you. Today, we will examine the um, housing authority that administers a variety of federal and local affordable housing programs targeted to district residents. The authority is an independent agency. The city's largest single landlord provides 7,000 housing accommodations to more than 10,000 district residents on 41 properties. The authority also administers roughly 15,000 federal choice program vouchers and the local rent supplement LRSP voucher program providing project-based affordable housing units included in local affordable housing projects that receive gap fi financing through the Housing Production Trust Fund. The authority also manages the voucher rental program and payments um, as it relates to rapid rehousing, the um, um, tenant-based um, uh, vouchers and the sponsored base vouchers that address um, programs to end homelessness and the housing needs of many of our most vulnerable residents. The LRSP is funded by local dollars and provides housing assistance vouchers to households whose income does not exceed 30% of the area median income. Um, these tenant base and sponsored base programs will be examined in today's second hearing with the authority and with the uh, Committee on Human Services that will begin at 3 p.m. Altogether, over 53,000 uh, district residents participate in the Housing Authority programs and services. The authority is led by an executive director who is hired by a board of commissioners. The board meets monthly and conducts its duties by passing resolutions that approve agency uh, projects and programs. The Housing Authority houses an Office of Public Safety, which is staffed by um, police officers who patrol the properties and are fully vested um, or empowered to enforce the district law. 
The authority also collaborates with the deputy mayor for planning and economic development on the new communities initiative, which was designed to revitalize severely distressed subsidized housing and redevelop communities experiencing concentrated poverty, high crime and economic segregation. The program has stalled for various reasons over the last 14 years. So today I am eager to learn from the director what steps the authority has taken to move the project along both independently and in collaboration with the deputy mayor's office. I'm also looking forward to receiving an update on the authority's transformation plan, which will reposition and repair 14 severely blighted properties using federal resources, such as the rental assistance demonstration and the section 18 demonstration disposition uh, programs. Public housing authorities throughout the country have already used these strategies to provide households with better maintained units and expand opportunities to leverage public and private resources while preserving affordable housing. Today, I hope we will learn the disposition of the work underway and plans for rehabilitating each of the transformation properties. While the current timeline established for completing these critical projects is 10 years or more today, I think we want to learn how the overall time can be shortened so that the city can realize safer, sanitary, attractive living conditions for some of our most vulnerable residents as soon as dollars and quality workmanship will allow. Additionally, today, um, I hope we'll be informed about how other key divisions of the authority are performing uh, regarding routine maintenance repairs, continuation of the ABLE resident employment earnings program, and addressing public safety needs on the properties and giving special attention to senior housing buildings and the need and providing quality services to all residents during the pandemic. Also um, share what will be different and how the authority moves forward as the pandemic subsides. With that said, let's get going. And I would like to recognize my colleagues who have joined us today. Um, member of the committee, council member um, Brooke Pinto and give her an opportunity to make opening remarks. Council member Pinto. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Bonds, for being here today and holding this important oversight hearing on how we have performed this past year and providing public housing that meets the very highest standards for human dignity. We are also here today to listen carefully to how we have been serving our district residents who are in need of housing vouchers in order to find safe, healthy, and affordable housing. Ensuring that our residents are able to enjoy the human right of housing is one of the most important priorities for Ward 2 residents and to me and our office. In Ward 2, we are now home to many encampments and neighbors reach out every day to see how they can help and better understand how the city is working to move these district residents into housing. Many feel as though encampments are growing each week and as soon as one resident is assisted and placed into housing, a new person or family seems to move into certain areas. And this trend is seen most dramatically in DuPont Circle. We really need to resolve this problem and provide proper housing to these district residents that they need and deserve. While more funding is needed to provide more permanent supportive housing vouchers to our residents, I understand there are many issues and challenges in the provision of housing vouchers, and we must work harder to improve and overcome all of these barriers to the implementation of our important voucher program. So we're here today to learn and listen about how we have done with our voucher program over the course of the past year and what we need to do to going forward to make sure that the program is more efficient and effective. We wanna be certain that the voucher program is working as intended, that residents are not being discriminated against by using housing vouchers uh, from their housing providers. And we wanna be certain that voucher holders are able to find housing in all neighborhoods in the district. I want to thank Director Garrett for his partnership and leadership. I've really appreciated the measures 
he has taken to try to expedite vouchers as we face a seemingly insurmountable wait list of residents in need of housing support. Again, thank you, Chair Owen Bonds, for all of your efforts to improve the lives of our district residents who are in need and who live in public housing and for all that you are doing to make certain that the voucher program is functioning as intended. I look forward to an informative discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councilwoman um, Pinto. Uh, Councilwoman Silverman, I understand that you are with us, another member of the committee. Yes, I am, Council Member Bonds. Good afternoon to you and uh, to my colleagues who've joined us, uh, the Housing Authority, and uh, to all of our residents watching. Um, first, uh, Council Member Bonds, since you took that moment, uh, which I thought was very nice, uh, moment of silence, I, I want to uh, commend the Housing Authority for its seniors vaccination program. I spent uh, the morning, Madam Chair, looking at our vaccination data. And uh, I have to say, I'm still extremely concerned uh, that we're not vaccin vaccinating our seniors at the rate we need to. Um, we know that the death rate from COVID is concentrated mostly in those 65 and up. And we're still only vaccinated, maybe with this week, about 55% of our seniors. Um, so I just wanna say that I think the uh, authority has a very targeted approach, a strategic approach, a smart approach, um, and probably has helped boost our numbers a lot. So I wanna thank them for that. So that said, when you have to balance the good and the need for improvement, let me talk about where I think we need big improvement. We are falling short on providing homes that are affordable to residents living um, on minimum wage jobs. Uh, and I think what is truly um, put into an stark relief with the, um, with, with this pandemic is that some of our most essential workers are some of our lowest paid workers. You know, these are the pharmacy techs who are helping us vaccinate. These are the grocery store workers who are providing basic goods to keep us um, with nutrition. Um, these are, um, you know, our phlebotomists and um, all kinds of uh, workers who are, who are providing these essential services, but they're paid very low, our home health care aides, and they need a place to live in our city. Um, you know, I, Madam Chair, I think I just we went on this rant, so I apologize, you've heard it twice now, but um, the recent, uh, oh yes, at the DHCD hearing. <laughs> okay, but not everyone watched that. So if you can indulge me. Um, so there was a recent analysis from Han Housing and it showed that the district is not even adding a third of the homes that we need uh, to add for our lowest wage workers. And you know, no jurisdiction's doing well here, um, but we need to do better. And every program we have um, to meet deeply affordable housing and homes involves the housing authority. It's not just like what we think about is, you know, public housing, like good times. I mean, there's section eight, there's federally based, project-based communities like that. But there's also, as you talked about, Madam Chair, there are vouchers, which are both project, you know, building based and scattered site, meaning you can get a voucher and use it to live in a building uh, all around the city. Um, it's also programs, as you talked about, Madam Chair, like the local rent supplement program that provide housing vouchers. And, and I think this is the important thing, uh, provide the operational subsidy for um, the lowest income housing that we build in that we need capital dollars that's provided through programs like um, our housing trust fund, which was talked about on and on and on and on. But 
the developers always tell us, well, you need to pair that money with a housing voucher. So you have to provide us these housing vouchers in order to make uh, the, the project pencil out, so to speak, in order to make it affordable, truly affordable. Um, and that's the housing authority administers those vouchers as well. So uh, I'm gonna be focused on three things, Madam Chair. Uh, first is, you know, how do we provide and what role does the housing authority play in adding deep, more deeply affordable homes in our city? Second, um, how can it do its redevelopment work? As many people who follow this agency know, it has a massive redevelopment plan that's important because our housing is, our public housing is falling apart uh, because the feds are putting less and less and less money in. Uh, and that's been true in Republican and Democratic administrations. And we've had to fill in the gap um, and we need to do that because the, if we let this housing go away, we're gonna have even less uh, affordable, deeply affordable housing. And third, I do wanna talk about governance. There's been a lot of um, stories in the press about the housing authority. I wanna talk a little bit about that. So thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the opening statement. I am going to duck out, as some of my colleagues might, around 1.30 for a call on COVID with the executive, uh, but I will be in and out all day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Councilwoman Silverman. Um, I understand that Councilmember um, Robert White, another member of our committee, is with us. Uh, yes, thank you. All uh, right. Chairperson Bonds, I uh, do appreciate uh, you, you having this uh, very important hearing. And, and I also do wanna thank all the public witnesses who made their voices heard at the public hearing last week. Uh, first, I, I do wanna acknowledge the tremendous work the agency has done weathering this past year. At the beginning of the pandemic, the DC Housing Authority pivoted operations quickly to continue its duties as landlord, service provider, and government agency. DCHA had to keep residents safe, contend with tenant income changes, and continue its myriad operations with the staff working from home and social distancing. And it's not lost on me how difficult this transition must have been uh, for an agency like DCHA. Almost exactly one year ago, the city was shutting down. And at that time, none of us had any idea uh, how long we would be in this uh, state. And, um, many of us really had to start to stay home uh, and uh, didn't know again how long we would have to do that. But the pandemic put into sharp uh, contrast, the, well, put into sharp view the critical need for safe and healthy housing for every resident. Many of us were fortunate and continued our work from home, from our kitchen tables in well-maintained houses and apartments. But other residents were stuck in shelters where social distancing is challenging at best or in close quarters in tent encampments. Some residents did have roofs over their heads, but in conditions that made staying at home challenging or even unhealthy in many ways. That's why it's so critical that we use every resource we have to keep our public housing online and in good repair and ensure that we are replacing every single unit during the transformation plan. It's also why it is of the utmost importance that it, we are moving our vouchers as quickly as we can fund them. If we can't get residents into homes as quickly as possible, we are simply wasting our money and doing a disservice to residents in need. Today, I'll check in on the transformation plan to understand where we are in the public process, when projects are moving forward, and how we can ensure residents are engaged in the transformation and have the right to ultimately return to the property. I also want to hear from Director Garrett about how we can streamline the lease up process for vouchers and simplify it for residents and for service providers. Last year, the DC Council contributed $50 million to DCHA's Rehabilitation and Maintenance Fund, which I pushed for aggressively. DCHA has worked hard to complete projects with prior fiscal year funding and identify projects to be funded with their FY21 budget. And I'm glad to see that DCHA has made progress and I'd like to understand how uh, efficiently they're using the existing funds and how the agency is planning for fiscal year 22. Finally, I'll ask the director questions about lead abatement in DCHA buildings. The auditor released a concerning report about DCHA's inspection, maintenance, and lead remediation for lead-based paint hazards. I shouldn't have to tell anyone here how heartbreaking it is that we still have children 
in the district who are poisoned by lead, which can cause a lifetime of challenges for a child and family, yet is 100% preventable. Children cannot live in homes with lead hazards. We're lucky to be stewards of an incredible uh, expanse of housing. And I know that all of us are focused on protecting and improving it to ensure that it is an asset that we all benefit from for generations to come. And I'm looking forward to the discussion about how we can strengthen DC's public housing while keeping public housing residents needs at the center of every project and process. Again, uh, Chairperson Bonds, I'll be in and out of the hearing as well, but, uh, but I do look forward to questions uh, and the statement from the agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Council Member um, White. And I think we've also been joined by um, a, another member of our council, um, Councilwoman Henderson. So if you would like to make an opening statement, um, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Bonds. Um, I'm not a member of this committee, but I've been here twice before. Um, very much interested in the work um, that's happening in, in sort of the housing sector. Um, good afternoon, Director Garrett and to your team. Um, I'm appreciative of the conversation that we were able to have last week. Um, and um, my questions today, uh, I guess, are sort of a follow-up from some of the things that we discussed, but also, um, was in a hearing last week with um, Director Donaldson from DHCD. And it's very clear to me that if we're gonna to get to a place in terms of affordable housing um, stability across the district, that I acknowledge that DCHA is not the only responsible agency here. Um, there's work that we need to be doing across the government, uh, particularly as it pertains to vouchers, which she made incredibly clear. Um, so my questions today are really around um, for residents who are currently in, um, you know, uh, developments that are managed and maintained by DHCA, um, how are we ensuring the health and safety of the individuals who live there, in particular the young people um, and the seniors? Excuse me. Um, so I'll have some questions about um, how you're progressing through work orders, capital projects, how are we using those funds? And then also some questions in terms of administration, which um, some concerns and issues were raised during the public witness testimony. Um, I recognize I'm not a member on the committee, so I'll be kind of last here, but definitely listening in um, and following up where necessary with some of my colleagues. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, um, um, members of the council. And, and now we will hear from our government witness um, and witnesses if he is bringing his team. So Mr. Garrett, we would like to swear you in and your team oh, members if they're Council going to provide Bonds, testimonies. Sorry to interrupt you, but one more of your colleagues um, has joined us as well. Council Member Nadeau is also um, on. All right. Sorry. Well, I will now um, ask Councilwoman Nadeau, a former member of this committee, if she would like to make opening remarks. Don't worry, Madam Chair, I don't have remarks for this round. I'm just here to uh, ask a, a few questions in this portion of the hearing, and then I'll rejoin you for our um, DHS portion. Our, our, okay, you know. no, no problem. Good to see you always. So, Director Garrett and your team members, if you would raise your right hand, we will swear you in. Do you swear and affirm that your testimony and any statements that you make before us today to be truthful and complete. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. And you may begin when you're ready. Okay. Director Garrett, floor is yours. One, one second, we ha we're having a couple of technical difficulties on our side. Hang on one sec, sorry. All right. Okay, we're good. Okay. Good afternoon, Ch Chairperson Bonds and members of the Committee on Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization. Um, I'm sorry, council member. I know that we have a, have a new title um, for the, for the yeah, committee. We have a new title, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I, I apologize. Um, my name is Tyrone Garrett and I'm honored to serve as the executive director and CEO of the District of Columbia Housing Authority. 
On behalf of the DC Housing Authority and the residents that we serve, um, we are privileged to thank the Bowser administration and the council for their continued support to fight the preservation of affordable housing in the district. I also want to acknowledge to the DCHA Board of Commissioners for their vision, leadership, and as well as the 787 dedicated DCHA employees I work with each and every day. With me today are members of my executive team who are available to supplement my answers um, to the committee questions. Um, I'm joined here today by Carolyn Cornegay Punter, Senior Vice President for Housing Choice Voucher Program, Alex Morris, the Chief of Planning, Design and Construction in the Office of Capital Programs, and Joel Maupin, Chief of Police um, of the DCHA Office of Public Safety. For the purposes of today's hearing, I will highlight the Housing Authority's performance and highlight a few successes. As the residents at home can see, I'm using a PowerPoint presentation to illustrate my testimony today. So my presentation may not exactly match what's submitted with the written testimony. DCHA is an independent agency, part federal, part local. We're held accountable by our residents daily and our board of commissioners at our monthly board meetings. Our mission at the District of Columbia Housing Authority is to serve, manage, and develop affordable housing opportunities for extremely low to moderate income households, foster sustainable communities, and cultivate human capital opportunities for residents to improve their lives. We currently serve over 50,000 residents through our public housing and voucher programs. Approximately 22% of these residents live in traditional public housing and the remaining 78 utilize vouchers. DCHA's portfolio it has more than 8,500 units and we administer over 17,000 federal and local vouchers in the private market. 84% of our residents are classified in the zero to 30% area median income band. An average household income for our public housing resident is $15,000 per year per family. Nearly half of our residents are children and seniors. We have three types of housing, traditional ACC, tenant-based vouchers, and project-based vouchers. 80% of DCHA's funding comes from the federal government via HUD and 20% comes from the district. 70% of all funding is dedicated to tenant and project-based vouchers, while 30% goes to support our traditional public housing units. Our traditional public housing and Section 8 properties are located in every quadrant of the district. In addition to our public housing responsibilities, DCHA works closely with its sister agencies, partners, to implement and critical affordable housing goals and services. DCHA's partners with the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development on new communities initiatives for the redevelopment and resident services at our Barry Farm, Park Morton, and Lincoln Heights properties. Our agency further partners with the DC Housing Finance Agency, the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Department of Behavioral Health, and the Department of Human Services to provide permanent supportive housing and other supportive services. We also partner with the University of the District of Columbia and the Employment, Department of Employment Services to provide training, education, and workforce development opportunities to all of our residents. Improving our communications with the residents and various stakeholders has been a priority this past year. We now have a dedicated staffer to build relationships with our resident councils. We keep everyone informed with email, text messages, calls, and literature drops and we have monthly meetings with the advocates and partner agencies. This year, we have utilized seven different communication platforms and pushed out over 1,200 posts and tweets. Especially during the pandemic, it was critical for us to reach as many of our residents as we could through social media. Additionally, we spent a great deal of time modernizing the agency's technology. We eliminated paper, started collecting and quantifying data, and developed metrics for accountability. We phased in new applications so that different department data could be shared and read on an integrated single system. These applications are run into a centralized data warehouse where they are combined with other automated data systems. Using Tableau, we leverage our data warehouse to create dashboards of priority and milestones. As you know, after an exhaustive review of our environmental and capital improvement needs of the entire DCHA portfolio, in, 19, in fiscal year 19, we released our people, our portfolio, and our plan, a 20-year transformation plan that clearly illustrated the urgent need to modernize properties in the instances that were actually beyond repair. At the time, we estimated that our need was over $2 billion. A considerable amount of research and site evaluation went into developing the transformation plan. However, nothing was or is ever more important than the feedback from our residents. To that end, we recently hired a new Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Stakeholder Engagement and Communications. 
Mr. Robinson will work with stakeholder engagement coordinators to fine tune our agency wide communication strategy. To date, we have held 31 virtual rental assistance demonstration meetings and, re and, res and redevelopment meetings at the same time. I will discuss RAD in a little more detail shortly. To ensure transparency, we also provided residential information notices, contacted residents before and after meetings, distributed hard copies of the RAD presentations, sent reminder texts and emails, and then posted our materials on our website after the meeting. After receiving significant feedback from stakeholders about the transformation plan, we have been working closely with the advocate community and will soon launch Transformation 2.0. A revised plan will show the lessons learned and will reflect on the insights of our residents and the affordable housing advocates alike. Transformation 2.0 introduces a nuanced approach to the development of financing and some of and also provides a more realistic timeline for the major rehabilitation of thousands of units. During our meetings with the advocates, we have worked to create a mutually agreed upon guiding principles for redevelopment. Our first, protect resident health and safety. Our second, commitment to resident choice. Our third, commitment to residents' rights. Our fourth, support resident economic opportunity and financial health. The fifth, resident and community-centered planning and engagement. The sixth, replacement of all existing affordable units. The seventh, build newly deeply affordable units. And the eighth, protect long-term affordability. I and my team are committed to ensuring that we abide by these principles as we work to transform our portfolio. The transformation plan is just not about buildings. It also has to do with how we run and manage our agency on a daily basis. I know that we can change the game and make the DCHA a premier agency. As mentioned, COVID has forced all of us to adapt to a new reality. Our management team was laser focused on continuing to serve our customers and set forth four priorities during COVID. The first, keeping residents and employees safe. The second, keeping residents and employees informed. The third, keeping properties clean. And the fourth, keeping operations open. We adopted new policies and procedures, conducted staff trainings, held town hall meetings with our labor unions, posted PSAs, deep cleaned our headquarters and made wellness calls to our residents. We pushed out content utilizing YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, email, text, and our website to keep customers apprised of our, and updated about our policies and procedures. We moved all of our resident services, including workforce and job training programs to virtual platforms. Managers staggered employee schedules and installed plexiglass for employees who had to report to the office or work site. We developed sanitation pro protocols and are now cleaning buildings twice a day, and we clean senior resident buildings three times a day. We developed and implemented a COVID tracing program to track any reported employee exposure. When we had a credible belief of, COVID, of a COVID case, we had contractors on standby to do deep cleanings. We updated our headquarters by installing a safe pass machine and air purifiers, built out a customer solution center and remodeled work areas to accommodate social distancing. We are following Mayor Bowser's guidance closely and will be ready when it's time for staff to return to work. In addition, we continue to foster incredibly fruitful partnerships with UMC and George Wash and the George Washington School of Nursing, Howard University, Hospital, Grapevine Health, and DC Wellness Institute for a variety of initiatives, including a mobile health van and COVID testing. An exciting and necessary development is our partnership with the Department of Health and Johns Hopkins Health and Sibley Hospital. Together, we set up on-site and, on and mobile vaccination clinics across the district. We communicated to residents, arranged vaccine spaces, and handled registration for these events. Our priority were those residents over the age of 65 in public housing or adjacent properties. Conforming to new vaccine guidelines, we are now including anyone over the age of 18 with a specific medical condition. To date, we have helped administer over 2,500 vaccinations. Today, I'm sorry, yesterday, we were at Knox Hill in Ward 8, and we have now ex expanded our outreach in Wards 5, 7, and 8, where access to vaccines had been limited. Standing up weekend clinics at recreation centers will allow us to expand our capacity. The first weekend clinic last Saturday in Ward 7, we were able to get over 500 public housing residents and voucher holders vaccinated. I want to take this time to personally thank all the staff who participated in providing these critically important services to our residents and community. In particular, I'd like to thank Hamel Gabrez, Brian Pugh, Cheryl Robinson, Sheila Harris, and all the staff who pulled together to make these events a success. And here are the names of everyone who participated. 
I want them all to know how much I truly appreciate the dedicated service and what they did for our residents each and every day. A public housing program comprises of 41 properties in all eight wards. We manage over 7,200 units varying in bedroom sizes. Our traditional public housing program is home to over 10,000 people. 21% of our residents are children, 18% of our residents are seniors. Self-sufficiency program has been an important part of our COVID, COVID initiative um, during this past year. We have continued successfully with the Achieving Your Best Life program, a program designed to fulfill goals of self-sufficiency and support home ownership opportunities. During this five to seven year program, 10 homes have been purchased to date. We opened our Family Self-Sufficiency Center last year at the Frederick Gluggins Community Center in Ward 8 to assist customers with financial literacy and home buying. Last August, we launched our credit billing and rent reporting program to assist with the building of credit for, individual, credit for individuals wanting to find self-sufficiency in the future. We've had 22 participants, most of whom have seen vast improvement in their credit scores. Our classes with UDC for hospitality and tourism and leasing for property management have moved online. We held seven online job fairs with over 220 participants. Prior to the onset of COVID, we held a recruitment fair for our Office of Public Safety and nearly 400 job seekers participated. We have held eight online financial literacy workshops with HUD and held a small business administration day event to provide advice for entrepreneurs. Engaging with students is another top priority. We have had a number one program, um, Do Your Best Summer Youth Employment, where we provide employment opportunities for youth ages 14 through 18 and our DCHA STEM virtual classes for ages 11 through 16. And every year, the agency participates in the Marion Barry Summer Youth Employment Program. We had a successful fundraiser for our youth programs during the holiday season. Our season of giving had a one person virtual race, which raised nearly $40,000. We have ramped up our fundraising efforts. And in the last year, as a result, we were able to provide $25,000 in scholarships to 13 residents enrolled in full-time college or an accredited training school. Despite COVID, we still launched our third year of the Modified Apprentice Training Program. And on April 2nd um, of this year, um, we're gonna graduate 35 trainees, all, DCHA, all DC residents from the program. My staff is currently working on matching these trainees with jobs with local employers or placement and union sponsored training programs intended to lead, the permanent, lead to in permanent employment. We provided hands-on experience in real work orders and virtual classroom training for 40 residents. One of the things I'm most proud of during this COVID event was to transform our headquarters building. Our modified apprentice worked side by side with our employees to build out a new customer solution center and rearrange workspaces to comply with social distancing guidelines. The work was done superbly by our tradesmen and women and with the help of our apprentices. This was a valuable real world work experience and I can't wait to show off the new spaces. Here you see another example of our trade and apprentice work. The construction of our new public safety command center is very significant because now we have real time visibility to all of our properties. The command center was recently completed and is another space we love to show off. Even during COVID, our property management office was diligent in completing routine and emergency work orders. Since March 2020, nearly 28 routine and emergency work orders have been completed. We brought our pest control services in house last year and have seen immediate results in actual financial savings. Overall pest control services are down for request are down by 21%. We have also reasserted the DCHA property management for the Horizon House, Claridge, Potomac Gardens, Hopkins and Regency properties and will be assuming control of Sibley Plaza in April to ensure that our residents are getting the level of service that they actually deserve. Our voucher program is provide, comprised of both local and federal vouchers. At the local level, we administer 4,300 tenant-based vouchers and 1,400 project-based vouchers. We are the sole administrator for the district and work closely with agencies like the Department of Human Services, Department of Health, Department of Behavioral Health, and Child and Family Services. At the beginning of COVID, a Housing Choice Voucher Program set up procedures and policies to institute virtual inspection briefings, voucher issuances during more remote operations that resulted in increased efficiencies. We held over 
432 briefings, issued 1,119 vouchers, and leased up 1,953 households. We have received national recognition for standing up at best practice in virtual inspections. We conducted over 4,000 virtual inspections in six months, 90% of them being virtual. While relocation was voluntary during COVID, we also helped 76 households relocate. We completed COVID income loss certifications for 674 families, recertified 874 voucher subsidies, and issued over 2,300 vouchers since March 2020. Not only did we pivot seamlessly to virtual operations, we have taken feedback from agencies and advocates and streamlined our local lease process. We reduced the employment verification timeline, added four more staff, including a dedicated DHS liaison and enhanced communication with landlords. Following our transformation plan roadmap, we have made progress in our most urgent properties, Langston, Judiciary House, Latroy, and Kelly Miller located in wards two, five, and one respectively, have seen significant improvement in the past year, including unit renovations, site work, roof replacement, and other upgrades. These are our recent unit renderings of a full gut rehabilitation taking place at Judiciary House. The photo on the right is a completed balcony at Judiciary. This is just a sample of what can be accomplished using HUD's rental assistance demonstration program for fund, as a funding model. RAD provides another resource in the development toolkit to move projects forward. We also have successfully used our rehabilitation and maintenance fund to complete critical improvements, such, fixing, such as fixing roofs, repairing elevators, repairing fire and alarm systems, as we recently completed at Judiciary and the James Apartments Complex. In fiscal year 20, we cut the ribbon on Parkway Overlook, a 220 unit affordable complex building in Ward 8 and the Harlow, a 179-unit mixed-income building, including 36 replacement units in Ward 6. And we are completing, as we speak, 108 projects with the $51.9 million in funding. We also closed three new market tax credit deals for DC Prep in Ward 5 and the Early Childhood Academy and Bread for the City projects in Ward 8, totaling $39 million. For fiscal year 21, the infusion of $50 million in capital funding from Mayor Bowser and the council is allowing us to make even greater progress. Thus far, the agency has submitted a request for over one third of it to the OCFO for approval. $26.8 million is going to be used for preservation and $23.2 million is going to be used for the rehabilitation and redevelopment of properties. As part of this work, we have made great strides towards remediating all environmental hazards with a focus on lead. You may remember that in 2017, DCHA developed a comprehensive lead action plan to accomplish this objective of portfolio-wide remediation of its lead hazards. The hazards are, are addressed using HUD-approved best practice methods of interim controls and full abatement. And despite the pandemic, during the last two quarters, DCHA has completed all the abatement work at the James Creek, Park Morton, and Villager properties. We have also completed exterior interim controls and or abatement at the following properties, Lincoln Heights, Kenilworth Apartments, Fort DuPont Additions, Montana Walk-Ups, the Montana Townhouses, Kelly Miller Townhouses, and Horizon House. By the end of fourth quarter 21, as we emerge from COVID protocols, we plan to complete the interior interim controls and abatement at the remaining properties outlined in our plan. Several new communities projects are moving forward. As you may be aware, in June of 2019, HUD approved the demolition and disposition of Park Morton. Based on the relocation of plan approved by the residents, the relocation of families living in phase one and phase two began in November and will be completed in May 2020. The Barry Farm Redevelopment Project is also moving forward. In January, the Historic Preservation Review Board set aside five buildings as historic landmarks. Those structures have been stabilized and waterproofed by fixing roofs, boarding up windows, and fencing until future use has been determined. All remaining buildings have been demolished as of September 2020, and the infrastructure work is ongoing now. Now I would like to take a moment to share an update on the redevelopment of our current headquarters. And I'm happy to report that there actually has been movement. Over the last year, DCHA has formalized its ground lease agreement consistent with the terms previously presented to the DC Council, and a closing is anticipated in early as this fall as the developer is entrenched in the design and permitting process. Additional deal highlights include a revised deal that increased affordable units from 200 to 244 
and at least 50% of the affordable units for the DCHA targeted and placed families are below 30% of the AMI. DCHA is committed to actively working with each and, every, each and everyone each day to help all of our residents and families. We do not take this work lightly, and we seek to partner with our residents and others who are aligned with our mission of creating, preserving, and expanding access to deeply affordable housing. We must use innovative and transformational solutions to meet this crisis head on. We must build strong working relationships with one another and stakeholders to create a united vision. We must work together collectively to ensure our efforts to succeed. Thank you for your time. My team and I welcome your questions, concerns, and or observations. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Garrett, for that um, very handsome presentation. Um, um, I must say, though, I was trying very hard to follow all your slides because it was so much information to digest. But thank you very much for um, it. it. Whenever you use graphics, it's sometimes easier to, to understand the progress that a uh, program has made. I do have a few questions um, that I'll start with, and I guess we'll, we'll try 10 minute rounds. I believe, um, do I have all of my council colleagues with us still, Sam? Um, I see I see Councilwoman um, Nadeau and Councilwoman Henderson, and do we have anyone else? Yes, and you still have um, Council Member Robert White and Council Member Henderson. Okay, I just wanna make sure I call them in the right order. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you so very much. Okay. All right, we're gonna have 10 minute rounds and, and, and I'll start with um, just, just some, I guess some general um, um, concerns from the um, presentation. Um, in your presentation, as you were talking about the transformation goals, you indicated that number eight was to protect the long-term affordability of your um, uh, residents. Can you elaborate on what that means to protect the long-term affordability? Yes, ma'am. Um, and thank you for the question. Uh, usually when you do redevelopment deals and you move forward with the opportunity to create some type of rehabilitation or new, con new construction, um, what goes into the, the fine details of the performer, uh, the master developer agreement, along with some of the other documents that create the structure um, for the um, the, the project itself, uh, you create affordability guidelines. Uh, your ground lease, for example, has a commitment to 99 years of affordability. Your, your financing term sheet um, has 40 years of affordability. Um, those are things that go into um, our documents when we deal with development partners and or if we move forward with equity investors, the, the financial market and different things like different individuals like that. Okay, and does that mean that for the um, various projects within the transformation plan that there is a guaranteed um, a return for any of the residents on the properties at this time? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The um, 1606 is one document that identifies the, the structure and that's for new communities projects, but also overall our process has always been when we submit our application for relocation um, funding um, from the federal government, from HUD, um, we ask that and outline that residents will have the opportunity and the right to return to all of our properties. Okay, so has the um, Board of Governors passed a similar resolution as it relates to the transformation properties or is it just limited to the 1606 for new communities? Well, actually the transformation, pro the transformation guidelines themselves outline exactly um, what we do in terms of residents re relocating and their actual return. And those are our guiding principles and that's what we've been following. We also have uh, additional resolution with, uh, I believe 1901, I think it is, that does hinge on some operational issues to make sure that we follow these guiding principles. I can go back to 1901. I'm trying to think about it off the top of my head. I think we did include um, some guidance for, you know, opportunity for return, if not opportunity for return, the guidelines in which we should be looking at um, redeveloping properties. But I can tell you again, in, within the transformation itself, that is one of our guiding principles that we follow and will okay. continue to follow. So I suspect that the committee will be asking for um, um, you to really go back and check and provide us with a copy of the 1901 
um, and also um, to look very closely to the governor's um, body passing a resolution that would make it plain and clear to the residents that what their rights may be as it relates to the redevelopment efforts. Yes. Okay, um, you also um, talked a little bit um, about um, your headquarters. And I might as well take this on the headquarters, 1133 North Capitol. You're now saying that 50% of the 244 affordable units will be at 30% and below, is that correct? Yes. Okay, we are talking about, and this is my favorite concern, we're talking about 1,200 units, and we're just barely at 20, 20 point something percent affordability. And that may have been what the original thought was in 2007 and 2012 as the project has moved forward um, through the various administrations. And, and I have to ask, Given that this is DC on land, uh, we also have a provision in the council that says if a uh, project is within, you know, close proximity to um, the transportation hub, like our subway um, uh, system, that we would, the goal would be 30%. And I, I, I wonder how can we get closer to 30%? Is that possible with this deal or is that likely or is that something way out of conformance at this time? I think we also should consider council member that um, of the 244 units, the AMI is zero to 60. And we have targeted to ensure that at least 50% of those 244 units are zero to 30. So remember, we don't go past 60% AMI on the units in total. So they're still marked um, and still conform with affordability guidelines. Yes, but if you do the math and deduct a 244 from 1,200 units, you have a considerable number of units that can be priced at, I guess, market rate. Is that what you're thinking? Well, we're not the developer, so we're... <laughs> but I mean, is that, well, but you're looking at the development um, mm -hmm. plans. Is that right. what the plan says? Right. The remaining units would, would, would be market rate units, but um, the 244 would be zero to 60 um, with the targeted dollar, with the targeted population of zero to 30 for 50% of those. Right. And, and we, I think we all understand that. So I mm -hmm. guess I'm back to this old question of how do we get to 30% and can we get the 30% is, are you striving to get the 30%? Do you see the need for 30%? Has there, is there information or data that indicates to us that it's not likely we would get to 30%? I'm just trying to understand that. Council member, what I can do is we can go back and continue to negotiate if we, if at all possible to try and increase the number as best as we possibly can. I mean, we went from 200 to 244. So um, our, if we can increase that number, we'll definitely make that attempt. You're getting there, you're getting there. All right, well, I, I appreciate that. And I'm sure my colleagues do as well. We are, we're working very hard to realize more affordability in any of our projects um, as, as much as possible. I think that's why we now have the proposal for IZ plus and, and what have you. So we're, we're striving towards that. We haven't reached where they are in Montgomery County, where they actually say to a developer, you know, you must do 20%, even in your market, um, um, rate um, housing um, developments, but we, we're getting there. And, and I think it's, it's really necessary. So I just wanted to uh, press you on that uh, particular point. Um, can you tell us the number of households in your inventory um, where um, death has occurred because of COVID? Oh ma'am, um, we're case. not keeping we're we're not keeping that total. Um, that would be something that the Department of Health may have. Um, we're only notified in case of um, there may be an outbreak or we need to do some type of contact tracing. But we don't have track or know how many people have contract contracted COVID or have passed away from it within our within our buildings or properties. So you do not know how many units have succumbed to 
COVID, you would have no way of keeping that information. No, we don't. We don't keep that information. We we that's a uh, we consider that probably to be more of a HIPAA HIPAA violation if we if we had that information of a cause of death. What does happen though, I can assure you, when we were working closely with the Department of Health, and if they saw that there was actual an occurrence or some type of COVID outbreak um, that they thought needed to be addressed, um, they would notify us. They wouldn't give us specific details about an individual, um, but they would tell us, and we would take action if necessary to do a deep cleaning or something like that within the building. Um, but to okay. date, honestly, council member, we didn't have any of those type of emergencies occur. Um, we did do deep cleanings when we first started because of the pandemic and we not knowing what to do. And we backed off of deep cleanings every week and moved to the three cleanings per day. Thank you very much. Uh, very um, quickly, can you um, talk a little bit about the uh, command center and the data that this command center is collecting? Uh, well, I don't know if Keiko has a, has a slide that you can throw up real quick, but in, in terms of what we're doing, the, the, that's only one piece of the command center. The command center shows, we showed um, our, you know, f over 500 cameras that we have throughout our properties that can be seen visually on a daily basis. But we also have an addition to, to this, and that's our AWD system. The AWD system allows our officers to go out to various points. Um, we're starting out with the 10, um, 10 properties. And as you can see from the dots on the board, those are locations where our police officers with their automate with automation through their phones have to touch on a, on a specific property um, when they go out on their tour. Um, so that's another aspect of automation that we're using um, in addition to just having cameras out, uh, out at the properties. Also, um, council member, I just want you to know that in terms of public safety, we also installed, installed over um, 637 new lights um, at various properties. So um, one thing we know that lighting is a deterrent when it comes down to you know, illegal activity. So there are a lot of things going on in the realm of technology. All of these things that you saw, the command center, what you see on the screen right now, the AWD are all remote, cloud-based. You can, I can get that information in real time on my phone or my iPad at any, any, any day. All right, well, thank you very much. I suspect I'm, I don't see the clock. Yes, I'm over a few seconds. Um, thank you very much. And now I'll turn to my, my colleague. I think Councilwoman Pinto, if not Councilwoman Pinto, I'll move on down to Councilwoman Silverman. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, good afternoon, Director. I do wanna spend one moment on uh, vaccinations before I move on. Uh, again, I think your um, partnership with Hopkins and Sibley is very good. Uh, I wondered, do you have the data, cumulative data of how many seniors 65 plus you have vaccinated and do you have a breakdown by ward? I'm uh, curious. I don't, think we, have, I don't oh. think we have a breakdown by ward, but I think we have a slide that actually shows exactly how many um, seniors have actually been vaccinated over the age yeah. of 65. So. Given you've invested so much in data visualization, can I get a breakdown by ward? Because I am curious how many uh, seniors you have vaccinated in certain parts of our city as opposed to the cumulative numbers. Uh, it might be very interesting. As you know, Director, we are lagging. I just looked, you know, even with all of our efforts, senior buddies and uh, prioritization, we still are only at like less than 60% of our seniors have been vaccinated. And then in certain words, it's incredibly low. So I am curious about um, how many seniors you've vaccinated, for example, in wards seven and eight compared to how we've done as a city. So if I could get, is that data possible? We can break it. We can break it down, um, okay. and it probably the yeah we have it. We have the total, which is okay. over two thousand five hundred. But we can break it down by ward. For that would be helpful. Thank you. I I look forward to getting that. I do want to. I was going to start somewhere else, but since um, Councilwoman Bonds um, brought it up, I do want to talk about eleven thirty three, your um, headquarters site redevelopment. I agree with everything. The chair said, and in fact, I started to get confused about numbers. So as the chairwoman said, you're redeveloping your property. This is property that we own. We're redeveloping for housing. You're, uh, you're currently, your headquarters is on there, so there's no housing. Director, you're going to uh, develop, uh, or it, it, there is, you're partnered with a developer, development team. 
did you say 1200 units are going to be developed is that the cumulative number the total number of units? As, of, as of yes as of right now yes okay and as you said um my understanding is 20 percent of that will be affordable affordable housing and 80 percent will be market rate is that right yes so that means that we're going to create 956 market rate units, which again, if people don't know where this is, it's right next to the new NPR headquarters, three blocks from basically two different metro stations, walking distance to the Capitol. So very prime real estate, right in Noma. Um, so that means that there'll be 244 units that are between zero and 60% AMI. You said half of those will be deeply affordable. So that means 122 units will be at 60% AMI, and then 122 will be at 30%. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So how? So um, now you said that no new vouchers will be issued uh, for this project. So do I understand that these 122? zero to 30 percent will these be people moving from other uh public housing authority properties well the first is the the, the replacement they're considered to be replacement units right so there were individuals that were living in that particular vicinity um prior to they'll have the opportunity to return first and then we would have the ability to open it up um to other residents whether they live in public housing currently they may have vouchers now may be okay. looking to move into particular units there um that opportunity will be given so these are as you so you got to my point how many replacement units how many units are we replacing all 120 like is there actually any new zero to 30 percent housing that's going to be created out of this project once again we're developing our own land how many actual deeply affordable units are going to be new? Net new. I would have to check the number on that. That's the, net new. the net new. The net new. And that's the thing. number of bonds. I think that's what your concern is. And it's my concern too, is that again, director, this is why this project has gotten so much attention. We are developing affordable housing, supposedly affordable. 80% of it is market rate. And I understand we do that to subsidize the affordable, but the percentages here just seem whacked. I, I can't think of another term because, you know, as I said, this is highly desirable uh, land. Developers have been developing all around you, market rate units. Um, and um, we are only like getting we're not even really getting any new units out of it. It just seems crazy to me. And I think that's the, that's what doesn't seem like the right, th like we're doing something wrong here. Why do, why do I think, I, I mean, I know why I think that. I think that if we own the land, we should be getting a lot more affordability and deeply affordable housing out of it. You got to explain to me one more time, director, why I'm, why, we can't get more zero to 30% out of this project, as Madam Chair said. So Alex, Alex Morris, council member, um, Alex Morris from our Office of Capital Programs um, can discuss this a little bit more with you right now. So. Yeah, so I'd, I'd just like to raise a couple of points. So the first thing is that the, the deal is structured so that we get affordable housing, including units for our zero to 30 population and units up to 60% AMI but also we get proceeds from the deal to be able to do other things, produce other affordable housing in other places. And so there's always a trade-off. You know, there's no new money here. It's always a trade-off between affordability and the money we take to do other things. So you know, at this point, if we, if we were to try to renegotiate to a 30% affordability level, it would just mean less money from, from the deal. That's really what it comes down to. The other thing is I well, it's I, I, I'm going okay. to interject, okay. you know, because the thing is, we need deeply affordable housing mm -hmm. near transportation, near grocery stores, near right. jobs, you know, and and that that's why this is such 
a missed opportunity, in my opinion, and it's driving mm -hmm. me crazy because um, this is where we need deeply affordable housing. Mm -hmm. The trade-off is, yes, we often put deeply affordable housing now where land is cheapest, which means that it's far from transportation, far from jobs, and far in, in food deserts. And that's exactly our equity problem in this city. We should, uh, the trade-off should be, we want to put people who are earning not so much money, but work at Kaiser, which is like down the street, which who work at Union Station in the retail stores, who work um, in our hospitals, which is just up North Capitol Street. The reason I'm so familiar with this property is I live near it. And this is where we need to put affordable housing deeply affordable housing. And, and I, we need, and I just don't understand why we're, we don't have more here. And, and council member, in, in this particular instance, let's not, for, let's not forget. And one thing that we were working on um, internally within the organization on this, with this transaction was that it originally was not um, a deal to create housing, right? So the, the creation of the 244 units, the idea of the total project itself was began with the relocation of the, of the agency itself in terms of its headquarters. So we have to keep that in mind as Alex pointed out, one thing that we're trying to figure out is a way to um, create an opportunity to, I know you say build not in deserts, food deserts or areas where um, they would be remote. And that's not our, not our goal at all, but we would like to utilize our proceeds um, to build additional affordable okay. housing in, in other locations. You, you mentioned to the ch chairwoman that you think there's some more negotiating room. So are we gonna be negotiating more? Um, we'll have a, we will have a discussion as best as we possibly can, council member. Okay, that doesn't sound good to me. Um, all right. Uh, I, well, again, uh, Director, I've heard all the explanations. You know, I've been on this issue. But if we can't do deeply affordable here, I'm not sure where we can do deeply affordable. I mean, we own the land. Um, that's very, very, very val valuable. Um, okay. You, you know what, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to be respectful to my colleagues and not ask another question that's going to go over time, and I'll be back for another round. Um, Councilmember Bonds, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councilwoman, and we'll now turn to um, Councilmember Robert White. Are you still with us? I am, uh, Madam All right, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me let me actually just pick up there on the um, uh, redevelopment of, of the headquarters uh, and uh, Director Gary, thank you to you and, and your team for being here today and for the work that, that you all are doing. Um, I, I guess I, I should first start to uh, settle expectations. Is, is there realistically uh, any more time to negotiate uh, on this or are, are the, the relevant papers signed and done? Um, we're, we're moving, they're moving towards closing. Um, so we're at that point, if the, if there should be a shift in terms of design, um, I believe that's an opportunity for us. I can't say that there will be a shift in design a creation of more units. Um, but I also committed that we would go back and have the discussion. Um, and I'm committed to doing just that. So, um, if, if you, if you can just help me under, understand the, so there, there'll be 244, um, uh, affordable units in the redevelopment. How, how much is the land worth? Oh, um, we've estimated the land to be roughly around $90 million in total. So let's remember, I, I just want to, I'm answering your question, but I also want to say we're using the land value to create that subs the subsidy and the affordability for those 244 units. Um, that's what's offsetting um, project-based vouchers or anything like that for the, for the project itself. Okay, maybe I missed something, but but maybe it just bears more explanation. Ninety million dollars for two hundred forty-four units. What uh, what what's missing? No, what's missing is we're using the value of the land is at, is at about ninety million dollars. We're cutting into that value to create the subsidy, so those two hundred forty-four units can be built. So we're roughly around using about twenty-five to thirty million dollars of our land value to create subsidy in to create the to build out the two hundred forty-four units. Okay, so the, the math on that equals about $123,000 uh, per, per unit. Why, why, not, uh, why not push down the land value more to create more affordable units? 
remember, we have to also relocate from this transaction. Um, and so it's going to cost the DCHA uh, a dollar amount in order to move someplace else uh, and relocate our agency to continue to provide services. Uh, remember, that's one of the biggest pieces to this puzzle also. Um, we want to be front-facing and continue to provide service to our residents um, as we have in the past. So um, we have to find a location that will be suitable for that at the same time. Um, so, and, and that makes sense. And, and I think people do need to understand what, what this this deal allows you to to, to build. Uh, are, are you going to own the new headquarters where you move? Uh, we are looking at what our options are based on the climate in the market right about now. Okay. Because the economics of COVID has changed some things. So we're looking and exploring um, whether or not it's a, a lease opportunity for us or is it better to purchase and own. Okay. But it won't require any uh, additional uh, tax dollars. So all, all the money for uh, your new headquarters will come out of the uh the uh sale of the current headquarters yes okay um and and that that is roughly 60 million dollars roughly yes right around 60. okay mm -hmm. now uh council member silverman mentioned uh something about these units being replacement units uh can you uh, elaborate on that uh, i think that was in reference to the old temple courts uh, units that were previously in that in that location. So um, some of those residents were relocated um, at, at a, period, a previous time frame. Um, they have the opportunity to actually return. I think it was about a hundred of those residents that we still have contact with um, that have that moved those year, years ago um, and that could come back if they chose to do so. Okay. And the it was Temple Courts. You you mentioned one of the projects uh, that had stalled for a long time uh, in new communities uh, that is uh, now moving, soon to be moving. Is, is Temple Courts among those? Uh, no, I don't believe Temple Courts, courts is among those. I think what you're talking about probably is the, um, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm in drawing. Northwest One? Yeah, Northwest One. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I was drawing a blank. Okay. Um, okay. So, but, but when Northwest One well, I'm sorry, when Temple Courts does, wh where is that? Is, is that going to come to fruition anytime soon? Uh, the replacement, well, I mean, the replacement units for the Temple Courts residents will be on our site. And we, we look to a, a closing within the next, before the fall. Okay. Um, and so what's going to happen with Temple Courts? Um, there is really no Temple Courts, so to speak. There are going to be the replacement units on site for us. Okay. Um, so they're... they're is there any housing currently at Temple Courts? No. Okay, uh, but there there was at at one. Yeah, point. There, there there was a and and I, I both Alex and I it predates both Alex and I, but there was um, units at Temple Courts. The residents were relocated via um, support from the housing authority um, using vouchers. Okay. And so those are the residents that we're we're, we're targeting to, um, for a return. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is um, the units. Uh, so I know where the residents are, are going, but mm -hmm. the, the units that were at Temple Courts, will uh, will there be a requirement when that redevelopment happens, uh, a requirement for a replacement of a certain number of units? Well, those are the units that are being replaced at the 244 units. Those are the, mm -hmm. going to be considered those units at Temple, the Temple Courts at the DCHA headquarters or 1133 location. So, but that, that means that either we are getting zero units at the headquarters or zero units at Temple Courts. It just depends on how you do the math. But Temple, but Temple Courts was never a public housing authority property. Okay. So that's the other piece of the puzzle. We, were, we, we issued vouchers um, to a private, basically issued vouchers to a private transaction, private deal. Okay. So who owns the Temple Courts land? Uh, I don't, I don't, I would have to check on who owns the Temple Court land okay. because but I think it's not the sitting, housing authority. I, it's not the housing authority. I think we might be sitting where the housing authority, I think we might be sitting on, and I need to check that, fact check that. Because I think listening and hearing Van Gogh, I hear Commissioner Van Goshry in my ear. Um, she always talks about Temple Courts, and I believe we might have been located at one time on the Temple Courts location. Okay. Uh, if you would uh, let the committee know, uh, I will. Or let us know through through the committee. I, I'd appreciate it. And I, I apologize. I don't have that historical piece on Temple Courts. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I want to address lead paint very quickly. The auditor released a, a report in 2020 in response to lead paint hazards in, in both public and private uh, housing and um, noted that uh, DCHA's inspection, maintenance, and lead remediation uh, for lead-based paint hazard uh, left uh, something to be 
desired. Uh, they concluded that DCHA had not taken adequate steps to protect residents from exposure to lead-based paint. Uh, and of course, DCHA is required to either complete interim controls or abatement within 90 days of uh, finding uh, lead paint hazards. So can you, can you tell us what your interim controls are and, and how they differ from abatement? Well, interim controls is not permanent. Abatement is, is a permanent process. And I just want to take one step back, um, council member. I don't want to take up much of your time to, to ask questions, but I do want to point out that our priority um, was to, to deal with the children um, under the age of six that were in units um, where we found lead hazards. The step back that I think we also, that we, that we recognized was originally before uh, my administration took on, took, took on the re responsibility, there were no risk assessments. So the first step in all of this was to do perform the actual risk assessments on all of the units within the portfolio. Once you perform a risk assessment, the clock starts ticking. And, and we did, and one thing that we did, and hindsight is always 2020, we knew we needed to have those risk assessments in place. We did all of our risk assessments at the same time. And so in doing that, that generated a number of units with lead, lead hazards all at the same time, which fell under the requirement of having to move people uh, families who had children under the age of six within 90, within 90 days. Um, we saw that was going to be a hardship for us because we didn't have necessarily, because of, remember, the exposure to lead wasn't the only thing that we had investigated. We investigated environmental issues throughout the portfolio. Um, but I can safely say that we did relocate or perform interim controls in every single unit where there was a child under the age of six or there was an expecting mother. Okay, um, I, I appreciate that, and I, I do understand the the complication when you do uh, overdo assessments and and you find things that aren't good. Uh, you you then um, have to get them uh, addressed or, or move people around, and that does create uh, a uh, a hardship. Uh, but of course, I think we agree that that we still have to to get that done. So with the um the the units that um that were found to have uh, dust only uh did did you abate those and if so how yes that's a cleaning that's a okay. just that's just a simple cleaning um you do a dust wipe and that's a cleaning it th those were primarily in our senior buildings um where we needed to do an extensive cleaning of the floors or the walls and, and those were handled um, um for us okay. um, by either a contractor or we did it ourselves also, we're still performing interim controls um, once we come out of COVID. So we did exterior interim controls or abatements for properties. And what we believe that by 2024, we will have performed everything, um, interim controls and abatement as mandated by our, uh, our HUD um, abatement plan, lead abatement plan. So. And do you reinspect them? Yes, interim controls require reinspection um, on an annual basis until they are fully abated. Uh, thank you, uh, Director. I'll have more questions for the next round. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, and next, um, Councilwoman um, Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Bombs. Good afternoon, Director Garrett. Uh, I kind of want to pick up a little bit of where Councilmember White was in terms of work orders and capital projects. Um, you mentioned that you did the risk assessments. Was that the risk assessments of the, were risk, were risk assessments conducted of the entire portfolio? Yes. Um, and beyond risk lead, was it also looking for mold as well or other yes. items? Yes, we did. We did risk assessments in addition to environmental assessments of every single prop, every single unit within the portfolio. Lead, um, mold, lead, mold, um, air quality, mildew. Okay. We did all of those things. Rodent infestation was also included in that. And when was the last risk assessment conducted? I would have to say the last risk assessment was probably spring. I, I you know, I checked the date. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to give need you a year. Uh, it was eight. actually, we finished those right around, uh, 2019. Okay. 2019. Yes. Okay. Um, in the last year, how many work orders, um, did you guys have requested? Over, I think we, we threw up the slide. It was over 10,000. And of those, how many have been completed? Uh, we still have a backlog of about 2,700. And remember, we did not do um, any, because due to COVID, we could not perform any routine work orders for nine months. Um, so that's why we have the backlog of about 2,700 right now. What's the definition of a routine work order? Um, that might be, you know, changing, changing a, a faceplate on an electrical, uh, electrical outlet. That might be a hole in a door. Um, anything that does not require, not, that, not a emergent, meaning that it's not going to cause um, a health or safety issue, 
uh, or cause um, more damage to the particular unit that will increase over time. Um, we identified those as possible emergency work orders also. Um, of the work orders, how many of those, of the, of the 2,700 work orders or any of those environmental? No, environmental, as you can see from our chart, we, we try to deal with environmental issues such as mold within seven days. Um, that's something that we consider to be a health and safety issue. And if we cannot fix or repair that particular issue within the seven day period, we tend to look to move the resident out to another unit. All right. Do you guys communicate that with um, DCRA and the Department of Energy and Environment? Um, I, I sit on the Committee on Transportation and Environment. We had a long conversation with the director around mold and the issue in terms of they can expect or they can come look at a DCHA unit, but they cannot enforce. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious in terms of what is the feedback loop around um, if DOEE or DC, DCRA are receiving a complaint from a resident around an environmental issue, are you guys circling back to say, and we have solved that problem? Yeah, we normally do, yes. If we get a call from DOEE or something like that, yes, we'll communicate back that we have resolved the issue or we've moved that particular resident. Um, and I can say, you know, communication can always be improved and, and we should let people know exactly what we're doing um, a little bit more in terms of our remediation and environmental efforts at times. But I believe it's a strong partnership between the two. Okay. And for the 2,700 work orders that are still open, have you guys communicated with those residents as to why you haven't yet resolved the issue? Yes, we have. We have okay. done so. And we are back on, you know, we're trying to get back on track now um, to okay. catch up. Um, so I understand that um, last year, you know, there was a, an investment in capital funds that was made from the mayor and the council um, in, in terms of, you know, dealing with the maintenance, uh, deferred maintenance backlog and those kinds of things. Um, have, has the agency expended all of those funds to date? Well, fiscal year 20, um, we've obligated all $39.8 million. Um, okay. 35.6 of that went to, um, construction. Um, and so that's about 89% that, that are in construction right now, um, based on the obligation of the, of the first tranche of money. For the fiscal year 21 money, um, which is the $50 million, we've obligated about 37% of that, um, and that's roughly about $19 million thus far. Um, we believe that we can be up to almost 30% obligation, about 30, I'm sorry, not 30% obligation, 30 million um, obligated by the end of April. Okay. Sorry, just taking notes here, because um, obviously some of this conversation informs where we go um, in terms of um, budget conversations in the future. Um, can you talk a little in terms of what types of projects have been obligated? Obviously, um, with COVID, I know that you can't do some of the work that you want to do in, in a unit that is not vacant. So where is this money going to now of the projects that are of the money being obligated? Well, it's still going to some make ready units, turning some units around. Um, it's going to elevators, it's going to you know roofing um, initiatives. As you can see from this particular slide, um, we've done a garage repair at Judiciary House at LaJoy. We were working on you know plaza renovations, um, office and lobby modifications, electrical. And, and a lot of it stems to also infrastructure. As you can see with Langston Additions, um, we mm -hmm. finished a san you know, the sanitary line, line to make sure that that was clean. We did a roof replacement um, and now with the, uh, the, the 50 million tranche, um, what we're really gonna start diving into are turning some units around, make ready units to bring some units back online um, to allow for us to do more work at the particular properties and, and prepare for possible redevelopment or extensive rehabilitation of units. I'm sorry, can you explain what a make ready unit is for someone who is not necessarily- oh, I, I, I apologize, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll defer to Alex. He can probably break it down in, in layman's terms. So. Okay, so, yeah, I only I'll, have four minutes. So like, okay. let's give me a one minute really, elevator. Really, really simple. So if we do a gut rehab, like tear the walls out and replace everything, that's what I'd call a gut rehab. Okay. Make, make ready is when we do a lighter touch in the unit in order to take a vacant unit and get it livable, up to livable standard so that it can be occupied by, by a family. So it's not, it's not like ripping all the walls and finishes off, but we're gonna do new flooring, painting, you know, any abatement of any hazardous materials, new finishes, new uh, kitchen cabinets, appliances, plumbing fixtures, that kind of thing. And I think we have a, you know, yeah, I, I don't think we have a slide of what that look, actually looks like, but. 
Okay. Okay. I mean, so, I mean, a make ready type of thing would be, um, if you have a family who moves out of an apartment, you might take the opportunity to do a make ready at that point. Is that Absolutely. Accurate? Correct. Yeah. And it also hit, I'm sorry. And it also hits, uh, I'm sorry, Alex. It also hits our um, vacant units that we have. We have PMO um, um, looking to turn around about 300 units this year. And we also have the Office of um, Capital Programs, which is Alex's team, um, looking to turn around about 357 units. Um, okay, so this adds, you bring another question. How many vacant units do you have across the portfolio right now? Roughly 1,500. And of those, how many can are mm, could possibly be livable if you had a make ready situation? Uh, we're looking at the 600 right now. Um, okay. We can reassess because remember, um, with our transformation plan, we're also identifying how to consolidate on some property. So um, make ready doesn't necessarily apply to every single property that we have, especially if they're in the redevelopment or transformation pipeline. Okay. I'm just, you know, you say you have vacant units. Mm -hmm. We have people who are unhoused. So right. And some of our, and some of our, and just the, the reality though, some of our vacant units, you can't turn those around um, in the manner that Alex is talking about. They require some extensive gut rehab effort and that would we could turn around probably three units um, for that cost. So okay. Okay. if I could just build on that comment for just a second, I, I think what one of the points the director wanted to make was that, you know, some of it is for unit consolidation on sites. Um, we're looking at several sites across the, the district where we can increase density without going back for rezoning. We, we're, we're currently built at a, at a lower density than zoning even allows in a lot of our, of our family sites. Right. So if we consolidate units, we can tear down areas of sites and we can actually rebuild denser and do uh, on-site build first. And so part of our strategy is to look at build, build first opportunities on, a, on the land we already control. And so it would be great to fill all the 1,500 units, but at the same time, we could also build more units on the same footprint if we could simply relocate some people and get sites freed up on our own land. So okay. that's part of our strategy as well. Now, I mean, I understand, I hear you on the build first, but I guess in sort of my knowledge of the history of DCHA, we have yet in modern times to successfully complete a build first project. Is that right? Probably true, yes. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk quickly about vouchers with my little 55 seconds that I have. Um, you know, there were a number of people who testified in terms of difficulty getting transfers to new units for medical or safety reasons. Can you speak to that, uh, considering we do have some units that are not occupied? Um, why does it take so hard to get a transfer? Well, we have to know the nuance of, of the request for the transfer. Was the transfer uh, ADA transfer where they need a UFAS unit? Um, that means the unit would have to meet their physical needs. I see. Um, if, and so there are other, it's a case by case basis as to why a transfer might not have been permitted. Um, when you talk about public safety transfers, those roll over into um, Chief Maupin's office. Um, he has to make the approval for those particular units. Um, many times also, I need to, need to just point out, sometimes we do offer units to individuals and they actually reject them. Is so that because of location or something could be, else? Could be, because, could be because of location. That's not a location that they would like to move to. Okay. Um, there could be, a, there could be a, you know, family, school, whatever it may be. Um, and so those are things that we have to take into consideration when we're offering units to, to residents. And sometimes it becomes a little bit difficult to place or offer a transfer when residents reject um, the locations that we have available for them. Okay. But we try um, our best to work with them as much as we can. Okay, I'm over time, but I probably will have some questions for another round. Thank you, Chairperson Bonds. Thank you very much, um, Councilwoman Henderson. Councilwoman Nado, I think I... Just okay, so, yes, all right, Councilwoman. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, Director, can you provide an update on the Park Morton redevelopment project and the related redevelopment of Bruce Monroe Park? Okay, um, for Bruce Monroe, I, I believe that's still in litigation. So I, there's not much I can offer on, on that as, um, as of right now. Um, but I can tell you for Park Morton, um, we're still moving forward with the relocation of residents. Um, we believe that we can complete that relocation um, probably by mid spring. Uh, we have about 12 families remaining in the phase one area um, that have been given the opportunity to use, utilize a voucher and or move to the phase two location so that when Alex talked about uh, creating an opportunity for build first on site, um, that would be an example of, of what we're trying to do there. Um, and um, the development team and the DCHA and DEMPIT are all working together um, to uh, officiate you know, how we can create a closing before the end of the year. When will the phase one buildings be vacated? 
uh, that's where we believe we'll have everyone out before the end of the before midsummer, by midsummer. That's what our that's what our goal is. Have the 90 day notices been submitted as required by the UL, URA? Um, no, not yet. And council member, I try to hold off on the 90 day notices as, as best as I can because it sends the wrong message of what we're trying to do. So we're trying to work with our, our residents as best as we can, turn around units on phase two side um, to allow for them just to move over there if they're not ready to move off site and that's not their choice as of right now. Okay, I got it. Um, I guess I'm just trying to use it as a benchmark of progress. Right like 90 days out. Yeah, from I, 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 I try to shy away from that because it always sends the, the wrong message. Um, so we're trying to work as best as we possibly can with the remaining families before we do something like that. It's always seen as a, a draconian move and that's not what we're trying to trying to emphasize here. Okay. Um, I, well, I can let you know when we get ready to send those so you can be prepared. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. And then when, when will the building permit application for the project be submitted? Um, I don't think they've been gotten to that point just yet. I think they're working on submitting permits. Um, I know they uh, I know they asked for a street vacation permit, I believe it was, um, thus far, but I don't know about the rest of the permits. I can find out for you. Yeah, I think the project timeline has the, the that they have to be submitted this month. Okay, see. I'll check to see whether or not they're ready. Okay, and then it's my understanding that one of the last remaining items for the project to move forward is a simple authorization letter from DCHA. Why hasn't that been completed? Uh, I don't know which authorization letter you're referring to, so. Okay, it's like a two sentence letter, basically giving your blessing that the land can be used for the project since you're the owner of the land. No problem in submitting that letter once it's requested of me. Nothing has crossed my desk just yet asking for that 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 two liner. It may not be at your desk, but it's been with the agency, I think, okay. since or before. And so here, here's why I'm asking, mm -hmm. you know, um, when, and this is true for DEMPED too, when certain project deadlines are not met, I fear it gives the signal to the public that we're not moving forward and, or that, you know, someone's making a change without informing us or something like that. And so um, I know that that letter has been pending for many months and um, so I'd really appreciate an answer on that from your team. I know we're going to be together later today, so maybe they would even have it later in the day for me. Um, and then also the building permit. Yeah, so the project timeline would have had it submitted this month. If phase one buildings were going to be vacated by May, which was the original plan, then, you know, we're kind of within that 90 day window that you're required to do under URA, whether or not it sends the wrong message. So this is me benchmarking and trying okay. to figure out where we are. No problem. And I'll try to see if we can get that information for you. Thank you so much. That was all I had, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, um, Councilwoman Nato. Um, and I hope that the, um, and to you, um, Mr. Garrett, I hope that you uh, understand very clearly that in order for us to spend the money that we'd like to come to the agency to continue the progress that you're making, we really want to know um, the particulars of these projects and not just the design and not just um, how many units we will be included in the project, but we really want to know what is it that entails progress as it relates to assuring not only the public, but assuring us that the monies are flowing properly because we are meeting all of our deadlines. And so I just want to reiterate that point that my colleague was making um, um, earlier. So just, so you, you, gotta, you, gotta keep, you gotta keep up to date and keep us up to date um, because we cannot be um, of help to make sure that the money flows uh, properly um, if, we, if we don't know. And I know that New Communities has been um, a, a, a big um, a problem for years, but we are finally you know, moving in some aspects of it. And likewise, as we look at the transformation plan in general, want to know how we are moving forward um, it would be great if you could provide the committee 
with um, some information that we could use that could benchmark progress um, as opposed to just saying, well, we're now working on doors, but give us some um, generic kind of understanding as to how we can measure these, um, these matters. Council member, we can give you a copy of what we submitted to the OCFO's Office of Fiscal Year 20. Um, and remember, we've obligated that, that funding. And what obligation means to us is that we've submitted to the OCFO's office um, our project plan um, along with exactly how the money will be spent. So we have that for fiscal year 20. And as I said, we have about 37% obligated for fiscal year um, 21, the 50 million, that we can give you a copy of everything that we submitted to the OCFO today. And, and that would be helpful, but could you also include in it, um, and, and it would require, even though you submit the plan, um, some indication as to where you are meeting those various deadlines. Yes, ma'am. It will have that. Would be that very has, helpful. The spreadsheet actually has, has that attached to it. All right. Okay. That would be very helpful. And you would um, continue to update it, let's say, on a monthly basis, even if there's no additional progress in a particular area or block. I don't have the form, so I'm, I'm trying to imagine what it looks like. That's why I'm trying to um, use language that is more general than actually knowing what the document actually says. We can show you a progress chart, yes. Okay, all right, okay. And you'll be able to indicate the date that there is sign off on these various aspects of meeting the progress, okay, we, for we, the we expenditure can, we can. and as we're providing the service. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to go through a couple of things um, that we have. Um, if you look at um, pertaining to attachment number 14A in your pre-submission questions, your spending chart shows that 96% of 2019 uh, funding as related to the trans now the transformation plan um, was expended or is obligated. So what is planned for the remaining percent of 4% that remains? Can I take that? Yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask Alex to go ahead. All right, so, Alex, thank you. Hi. So subsequent to that uh, chart being put out, uh, we put in an additional uh, two projects, two phase projects at Langston Addition to expend the remainder of the 24.9. And we also have uh, one contract at Langston Addition for phase five and uh, an additional contract for sanitary lines at Judiciary House that will expend the 14.9. Okay, now these sanitary lines are, is this a part of the citywide program to remove lead-based lines or? No, and I don't, I don't know off the top of my head if they are lead-based, but um, the sanitary lines are inside of the building at Judiciary House and they have been um, one of many issues of constant uh, maintenance calls for leaks over the last several years. And so as part of our infrastructure improvements in the building, we're replacing the risers, the sanitary risers that go vertically in the building to pick up the wastewater from the from the units and we're also replacing the laterals that go in the basement across the ceiling of the basement to the street so okay. all that will be replaced so once that part of the uh, rehab is complete mm -hmm. will the will the property finally be completed completely renovated no 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 <laughs> no the um so at Judiciary House, for an example, uh, we have phased unit rehab. We're currently working on 28 units in phase one. And to your point about COVID, yes, we have paused on moving residents back into phase one and starting phase two because of not wanting to put anyone in jeopardy health-wise, but those units are being completed. And we would like to, um, when, when the time allows, I wanted to offer that if any council persons, yourself or others would like to take a tour we would love to show you uh, the completed work when it's safe to do so. But, um, you know, the phases two, three, and four will occur by rotating residents into temporary housing within the building and then doing additional unit blocks of 30 at a time as we go around the building. And that's why it takes longer than a year to do it because each phase takes about six months to complete. So if you have four phases, it's about a two year uh, time frame all, all total. 
And council member, we're being very prudent with the district dollars. Um, there will still be remaining work that will need to be done in judiciary um, to hit another 167 units in the future um, for, full for full renovation, along with additional work to be done on other um, electrical lines and other um, sewer lines and different things like that within the within the building, the infrastructure. So it's we're getting we're going to be get halfway there and then we're going to have to um, continue the work on the other half of the building at, at a later time. So if, if I am a constituent and I'm looking at the work that's going on at that property, I can estimate that in the year of 2022, work will finally be completed? We will have, um, I would say more like probably the first or second quarter of 23, we will have all of the phases that are currently funded at Judiciary House completed, yes. And the residents will be moved back into their new units. Um, as I said, right now we're working on framing and drywall in the first phase of units to complete those and get those ready for remove in. But we did want to make sure that we could do that safely um, and make sure that we didn't put anyone in jeopardy health wise. So uh, we're going to make the decision uh, once we look at the vac vaccination numbers and the COVID uh, status when we uh, when we move people back into those. And, and, and council member, it's up to the administration right now with working with the district dollars is to also seek and find other dollars um, to finish up the and button up the building completely um, with the other work. So we don't want to wait until um, one phase, as Alex talked about, to be completed. We really want to figure out a way to overlap with additional dollars um, if we can find a way to do it. So would you provide to, um, to me, to the committee, um, some indication of what that dollar point would be in order to move quickly. It's about, seven, it's about 17 more million dollars. 17 more million. Can you go through your portfolio of the 14 projects where you have current activity in play in the way of renovation and give the committee a sense of what the actual dollar need is to speed up so that we can complete those projects, let's say in a year and a half or 18 months? Yes. Thank you. That would be very helpful to us. Can we get that um, in the next um, two weeks? Get that information in the next two weeks? We'll work, we'll work towards that. We'll, we'll do that. All righty. Okay, number 10 question here. Um, uh, this is about contracts that are listed in attachment 18. It says, okay, why is the um, authority using outside counsel um, for the OAG safety complaint? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, we, we often use litigation counsel, outside counsel to, to deal with litigation issues. Uh, we never try to handle that in-house. Um, although we have a, a staff of attorneys, we utilize them. Our general counsel um, manages an outside litigation um, firm um, to, to work with us. So that's okay. one of the reasons why we do that. Well, I noted that um, the all of your contracts are usually listed as either competitive or sole source, except there are three emergency contacts. Tracks. And these are for a um, emergency trash disposal and collection. I know this is an essential service. I'm just really curious as to how such an essential service gets relegated to emergency. And well, why no, not one of the other types of contracts, which you customarily do, certainly it would lend itself to maybe a competitive um, form of contracting. No, I think, um, council member, I think what you're looking at, and we, I'll go back over it, um, that's something that's extraordinary beyond routine. Um, our routine process for trash pickup, trash collection is, is a procurement process. Um, that is probably um, an emergency, meaning that it's something that goes well beyond the scope of what the current team um, can do, or we might need to bring in an additional contractor for um, excessive amount of debris or something like that, or, or something more major. Um, that's not our normal day-to-day -day operational trash collection or pickup. All right. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. So you're saying that this was um, an addendum to what is customary, which is a competitive contract that does in fact operate on the various properties 
So you had it, okay, all right. And in, in so. addition, and as I and, and and as I think more about this, this is probably one of the this is probably the actual contract where there is an actual contract dispute. Um, so I I I can confirm with um, my procurement officer, but this may be also an issue where we had a contract dispute with. Um, during a bid process, um, and we needed to go out for any emergency service because we weren't allowed to contract or procure with that direct company that we had selected. So, um, could be all one right. Of would you please submit to the committee a little note on that so we yeah. understand mm -hmm. um, precisely what it entails? Um, I'm going to move to my um, other council members. I am Council Member Pinto, if you are here. I think everybody has left council member aside from council member Silverman and council member Henderson. All right, council member Silverman, the floor is yours. I know she said she was going to step away from 1.30, so she might actually not be here. She just stayed All on the right. call. All right, councilwoman um, Henderson, floor is yours. And it looks like the same might be said for council. All righty. Okay, very good. So I want to continue, please, um, for a minute. Um, in question one of the pre-hearing questions to, from the agency, you said that um, I want to know about the staff um, eligibility and continued occupancy department. Um, what is the, the work of that agency? How much... How much communication and coordination occurs across departments daily, I guess is really my question. Well, I, I couldn't quantify how much, <laughs> I really couldn't quantify how much conversation and communication goes between because we're all working in tandem on various projects, meaning that ECI, for example, not only works with the Housing Choice Voucher Program, but it also works with um, property management operations. So there is a, a lot of cross, um, cross conversations, cross communication between departments um, at, at times. ECOD may even have a conversation with, um, with OCP. So um, that's their, their purpose um, and, everyone, you know, and the, everyone touches them. All right, and you know, the reason I um, um, put that question to you rather vaguely is because, um, and one of my colleagues has already alluded to uh, the issue of, of governance and um, the articles that we see periodically um, in the media that seems to point to there being um, uh, communication issues. Um, and I, I really want to understand what's going on there. I know that you are relatively new to the agency in the sense that many of your employees have decades of uh, work experience on, on the premises or in the program. And so just wondered, um, is there something that we at the council uh, can do to assist through this process? I, I understand that when, when things are new and things are changing and they're different from the methodology that I learned in the past that I may have issues, but are there really, I mean, do you have a handle on this, this vessel, this, this, this agency that um, can uh, quiet the waves a little bit and uh, <laughs> just what's, what's your viewpoint of, of how things are proceeding? This is a battleship. This is a battleship. battleship. Right. And when I say it is a battleship, it, it, to turn a battleship or a cruise ship for that matter, um, it takes a minute. Um, it doesn't turn on a dime. Um, and I believe that I am a, the, the closest thing to a change agent um, um, that DCHA has seen in, in a few years. Um, and the, the way I want to, to work, the things that I want to happen um, within the organization um, might not be consistent with the way things were done in the past. I work at a pace um, and, and I have expectations. And I also, along with those expectations, um, hold everyone accountable, including myself. Um, and again, um, you, you figure out what works for your team. Um, you figure out what team teammates can, can work with you um, and work with the other teammates on their staff or on, in, in, their, in their unit. Um, and you go from there and you make adjustments as you go along. Um, I think one thing you have seen in, in the past, people come in and they, you know, new broom sweeps clean and everyone goes. I didn't take that approach in terms of my administration. I wanted to see what I had to work with um, and what 
what changes I needed to actually make within the organization. And I think we're moving in the right direction. And we've made significant progress over the last three years. Um, and I think we're only going to be going in the right direction go going forward. Um, as you can see, the transformation plan was somewhat rough when we first rolled it out, um, but now it's rolling. You know, obligation of all the fiscal year 20 money already. Um, and almost, you know, at almost at 30, 30, 37% right now with fiscal year 50, 50, fiscal year 21 and the 50 million. I don't think anyone had imagined we had the capacity to be able to pull that off. And, and so I think that's a testament to the hard work of my, my team across the board, OCP, PMO and Housing Choice Voucher Program, just to name a few, along with our other, other employees of the agency. So, you know, articles come out, council member, um, people write what they want to write, people believe what they want to believe. Um, but in, in the reality, I think this is a, a great agency and I think we're proving our, our worth within the district. Well, you, you are commended for the um, um, changes that we can see in, in the public in particular and at the council, you know, the expenditure of the resources, um, all of that, that is good. So I just wanted to you know, bring that to your attention, you know, officially. Um, also wanted to ask a little bit about the um, Board of Governors and whether or not it's time for a, maybe an increase in the number of individuals that operate at that level. Um, is that something that could, um, make a difference because as an example, I know that we are pretty much limited to a representative for the senior um, uh, housing uh, properties, a representative for the uh, voucher program, a representative, um, I think there's one for, that represents the um, building trades industry and that would have some working knowledge hopefully of how construction um, moves forward. And then there are a bunch of other kinds of positions where, um, in fact, we just um, confirmed um, three positions on the, um, on, on the governance board. And so just wondered if maybe we need to have um, a, a few more positions need to be represented. Uh, maybe high financing, I don't know. Um, Maybe, um, maybe the, the population needs more than one representing um, public housing or more than two representing public housing. Just trying to understand um, what would be a better mix um, for the Board of Governors. I, I think I, I can't say that there's any particular number of commissioners that need to sit on the board, but I can tell you that with this administration, we know that education is very important. Education of the members that we have in front of us right now. Um, and we're going through uh, actually getting ready to start up our educational series with Rutgers University um, this in, in April, actually, um, to educate board members about the process of being commissioners and how a housing authority actually works. I know there are a lot of things that people think bring, that they need to bring to the table in terms of outside experience. But one of the components that's very important for us is for a, a, a representative on the board to understand how a housing authority operates and what parameters we have to, and what world we actually move in within the industry. And that's very important. So I don't necessarily put a cap or a, an amount, a minimum or a maximum number of commissioners that we may need to have. But I do think that it's incumbent upon the, uh, me, uh, along with my, my staff, to educate our board members as to what we're facing and, and how we have and what resources we have to deal with issues. Okay, well, thank you for that response. Um, um, can you talk a little bit um, about the ABLE program and what I'm asking um, you may recall last year, <clears throat> I had some conversations with um, individuals who are some of the residents and are on public housing properties, and they were under the impression that they had earned credit dollar amount that could um, help them to leave public housing and buy a unit. And um, I want to know a little bit about that. Is that still in progress? 
Yes, the ABLE program is still in process, but it is a, as I said in my, in my earlier statement, it's a five to seven year program that people have to participate in. Um, there are nine families enrolled in that particular program. And there are also criteria council member um, that they need to, to hit. There are certain things that they need to accomplish, um, like, almost like a, a, perf, um, a creation of a pro, uh, management um goal, self-sufficiency management process that they need to go through and their targets that they need to hit um, throughout the process. So we've been talking to them, we've been counseling them, we've been interacting with them about the program um, so that they can realize the true benefit of the program, of the ABLE program overall um, and, and, earn a, and earn an opportunity to purchase a home. Okay. In the next few minutes, can you tell me what you anticipate to get through the American Rescue Plan? Um, I, I don't anticipate anything um, just yet. We haven't heard in, in my in my world. We haven't heard about any type of stimulus for housing authorities. Um, we did receive funding from uh, the CARES Act money, um, but that was what we were limited to, you know, support of our public housing portfolio and support of the Housing Choice Voucher Program. But as far as the larger stimulus package, um, nothing has trickled down and there's no word of what housing authorities may be receiving. Okay. If anything. All right. You have really answered a number of questions that we had. My colleagues have been very um, up to date on some of the issues that we wanted to discuss. So I... Um... One of your colleagues is back. I know, and you'll be given an opportunity, 100%. Let me ask you, um, Mr. Gary, when an occupied public housing unit has deteriorated to the point that it's no longer safe for the resident to remain, what options does the authority have to um, make another unit available to the resident? Uh, we would look for the opportunity to turn around a unit that, or, or identify a unit that's already turned around and available for that resident to move into. Um, primarily, we try to find a unit within their immediate community um, that's available. If not, we look for you know units that are outside um, that particular property at, at other DCHA portfolio uh, um, maintained um, units. Um, so that's do the, you, we don't so offer do you, vouchers, though. No, we don't offer, um, in a particular situation like that, we wouldn't offer a voucher. We could only offer another public housing yeah. unit to that individual. All right. And, and so in offering another unit, um, is, there, um, is there a hard and fast um, set of regulations that you must follow? Like, for instance, if the family is in a two-bedroom um, and it is... Um, restricted that must be on the ground level or they're in a ground level unit do you try or are there regulations that say they must go to the a similar size similar located um, facility or just how is it done well it depends on what we're talking about council members we're talking about an actual emergency move where we identified a unit where the resident can no longer stay in. Um, we, I'm not gonna say we throw the rules out the window, but um, we try to make sure that that individual is put into a safe space. Um, that's, the, that's the first goal. But if we're talking about an individual that is in a, a unit that can be occupied, there's nothing wrong with that unit, but they're looking to transfer, then we will apply our, our rules, our transfer rules to that particular individual looking to go somewhere else. Um, but on an emergency basis, if it's something that we have to do immediately for the life, the well being, and health and safety of a family, um, we don't. We don't do that. We find the unit that is available um, at, at the earliest, the, the unit that we can find at the earliest possible um, manner to move them into. All right, would you make sure the committee gets a copy of, of these rules that you generally follow with, you say with the transfer of yes. a uh, resident from one location to the other within the public housing portfolio? Yeah, we distinguish between a, a request for a transfer and something that would be deemed an emergency transfer um, help for health and safety reasons. Okay, very quickly, do you have uh, regulations as it relates to um, voucher persons who are in a voucher unit? Is it similar or is it different? It's different, it's different but we do have policies for that, yes. Okay, all right, well, my time is up and I'm gonna turn to council member uh, Henderson, but I would like to learn a little more about 
what those regulations are. Okay. Councilwoman Henderson. Um, thank you, Councilmember Bonds. I'm trying to take this opportunity because you had so many members of your committee who are <laughs> engaged on this hearing to slide in while they are busy right now. Um, I, I just want to follow up on a couple of things, um, Director Garrett. Um, uh, when uh, an individual is approved for the local rent supplement program, about how long does it take for them uh, in terms of processing for a lease? Um. Normally it would take about 90 days or so, which is too, which is definitely too long. And we've been looking to figure out ways to cut it down to at least 30 to 45, if at all possible, shorter than that. Um, and it goes to, you know, processes that we need to take on and changes that we needed to make in supporting the local program. So we've created some efficiencies. Um, in the beginning, we were mirroring, totally mirroring our housing choice, about federal housing choice voucher program. We've relaxed that and moved away from doing that, which probably put a little more time um, into, you know, we bought us more time and we've been able to really make some changes and some strides. I think one example I can, I can say, and I know you have other questions for me in reference to this, um, but, you know, since... Um, October and November, where we were only averaging about maybe 40 eligibility um, eligibility um, approvals, um, we've moved that up to at least over 100 per month um, since we've made our changes. So I think that's important to note that we recognize that there was a, a, a log jam. And so we, we took steps to try and right the ship. Um, we're also working off the, 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 the same system um, as the, the Department of um, Human Services now, um, which okay. we weren't doing before. Well, so I guess my question more or less is why does it take so long? Is it a uh, staffing issue? Is it a paperwork issue on the part of the resident or client? Um, is it, I'm just, how, how can we trim down this process? Because you can imagine the type of anxiety of someone knowing like, woohoo, I've been approved. And yet it's still taking me months to actually get to a point of having housing. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the one one example I can show is that you know in the like I said in the month of Delo in the month of December we only had 50 people deemed eligible. Um, May we made we made changes in we made changes in changes in adjustments. We made changes in adjustments to our process um, in conjunction with working with DHS. And what we were able to do for the month of of January is increase our number of eligibility participants to 181. So there is a significant jump. So moving forward, you're not going to see the same backlog in terms of eligibility for residents. Now, there could be a myriad of reasons why. There could be paperwork that we're trying to receive um, and we're not getting it back in, in a timely fashion. Um, but we try to relax and do self-certification. So some of that paperwork that we thought we needed back for employment verification, we relaxed it and we allowed an individual to do a self-certification because we know the population we're dealing with, right? Individuals that may not have a permanent home right, don't have a permanent home right now, maybe some of their information doesn't come, come to them and, and they can't get an employee ver and verification. So we've relaxed those rules. We brought on individuals um, to work, designated individuals just work with DHS. So I think over the next, I think we're working off of and looking at a short time frame of our changes. I think what we need to do is give it a few more months to see exactly where we are, and whether or not the changes that we've made are sufficient enough to move the program more rapidly. Okay. Well, all right. So I don't know when your budget hearing is, but that will be in a couple more months, Yes. probably sometime in May. So I expect that I'll come back to sort of ask about this question um, just because I feel like where we can improve and expedite it, we certainly should. And, and thank oh. you for, and I appreciate the question because that, and, I mean, it, it sets up the, the, the point where in May, we will be able to look at, have the changes that we've made worked. Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, I wanna go back to um, a line of discussion that my colleagues were raising around um, the headquarters development. And um, I recognize that you are at a place in terms of about to sign a contract and all of those different things, but I just wanna to try to wrap my head around the expense here, right? So based on the numbers that you provided <clears throat> of having 244 affordable units on the site um, and that that is taking about 25 to $30 million of the land value being used for the 244. We do some math. That means that um, the affordable units are costing the city roughly around $122,000 a piece. And actually they're not costing the city, they're costing DCHA. Well, um, 
So that's revenue. So that's revenue that that's revenue that we're using to try and uh, you know effectuate additional affordable units or affordable units on a site um, that originally didn't have affordable units, so to speak, right? So right. it was a headquarters, and the deal itself was never a, a deal for the creation of housing. Um, it has become that. We understand why it has become that. Um, we're all on board. We're trying to make it work as best as we possibly can by going into land value to, to make this work. But um, as I said, we need to also be mindful that um, preserving uh, the opportunity for us to locate another headquarters was the genesis of the deal itself. No, I understand. What I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is, or I'm trying to understand whether or not um, the cost per unit, roughly that DCHA is paying, is that an average cost per unit for an affordable unit no, across no, the district? Actually, actually um, in DC, the cost of affordable unit is over $300,000. Oh, okay. Um, and sometimes hitting right around four, 450. Okay, so that helps uh, solve that question. Okay, um, I mean, we, I had a, in my questions with Director Donaldson, um, we, we talked a lot around, um, the Housing Production Trust Fund, building additional affordable housing and where that tie is in terms of vouchers. And she was very clear in saying that if we wanna have more affordable units in the district, um, we have to provide the funding for the subsidy for those units in the long-term going forward. And I think that is, a, this is something for my colleagues and I to have to think about in terms of going forward. Yes, we want more, but we also have to provide the voucher and the subsidy on the back end in order to be able to, um, to do that. Um, going back to a question I asked you in the last round around the 1500 vacant units that you have. I know that you said some of them are not, um, what, what do we call them? M made ready or ready made? Make ready. Make ready. Make ready. Make ready. Make ready. Make ready. Uh, but that they require some additional work um, if you had to estimate from a cost value, what would it take to bring those 1500 units online? I'm going to punt to Alex on that, but I just want to say, remember, remember our transformation plan talked about $2.2 .2 billion across the portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. And capital needs. So that you, you start, kind of start from there. Um, and then you, and then I'm going to pivot to Alex to be able to break it down a little bit further for you. Right, but oh, let me just say, I, I'm focusing on these vacant units only in that you don't have somebody who's currently in them, right? Some of them may require demo or those other things, but um, it doesn't require moving anybody as far as I know um, in order for us to bring these right. online. Right, Alex. So um, in answer to your question, what does it cost? Um, I don't have the calculated number for the 1500 units, but on the last 14 projects we've done to turn units, it has ranged anywhere from 23,000 on the low end to about 70,000 per unit to turn a unit. And that really depends a lot upon how much work needs to be done. If it's just a matter of cleaning out garbage and repainting and freshening up everything, putting new appliances and cabinets in, then it's probably like 20. Okay. If it's, if it's you know, fixing major damage, then it's probably more like 70,000 per unit. So you can, you can project out the math for 1,500. Um, I'd like to correct a, a thing that I didn't get a chance to really answer before in your, in your question about have we ever done Build First before. We actually have. It predates me, but we, with our district partner, we actually have done Build First in the past at Nanny Helen Bull, uh, Burroughs Boulevard, uh, Matthews Memorial, Sheridan Station, and also at the Avenue uh, as replacement for Park Morton. So in, in the NCI projects, um, Respectively, we actually have done, uh, in conjunction with the district uh, government, we have done uh, build first before, not on site, but off site. Right. I was saying on site, but um... right. no, on site we have not. But we're we're looking at it, and it's the easiest way for us to do it because it doesn't require us to buy or get uh, in kind donation of land. Right. So that's really why we're why we're looking at that. And council member, just so you know, from a housing authority standpoint, how we operate, how most housing authorities operate, build first is based on that particular concept. Uh, a, a phase relocation move of certain residents in a certain area um, to allow for con new con demolition and new construction. And then you move in that manner. So um, most, most housing authorities consider that to be a, a phase, a phase, a build first concept. Okay. And in my last uh, little few seconds here, I just want to ask a question that it is a genuine question and it is not one that is coming out of one place or another, but I'm just curious, why does the housing authority have its own police department? 
Is this required by federal law? No, ma'am, it's not. Okay, is it? Okay, so why? Um, uh, <laughs> some, 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 some agencies have a, have a housing authority, ha housing authority police department. Um, I believe there, it was created in, originally created to supplement MPD, um, to help MPD cut in, in their coverage. I'm not gonna call them issues, but to help for coverage of housing authority properties. And Chief Maupin is on the, on the line and he can, he can jump on and give you a more specific, cause he's a, a veteran of MPD now with us. So he can tell you exactly why it was formulated. But um, my understanding is that it was in support of MPD originally. Yeah, so good, um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, the housing authority police department was established, I think around 1995, somewhere around there. Um, it first started as a branch of MPD, where MPD officers were assigned um, to the Housing Authority uh, to um, provide additional coverage on the footprint. It kind of migrated into its own department when the City Council established it as a police department and authorized uh, the officers to have sworn capabilities very uh, um, just like MPD. Um, what it is now is we augment um, MPD um, on our particular properties. We not just um, perform the, the law enforcement tasks, but we also enforce housing regulation, uh, housing rules, um, and a lot of administrative tasks um, that's required. And one of the major things we do is work very closely with our residents, um, something that um, MPD could, would not have the ability to do. Um, um, working um, um, with outreach initiatives and uh, um, the various programs that the residence councils put forth. Um, I think our, our residents have become accustomed to it um, and um, something that they would so surely miss if uh, we weren't able to do that for them. Um, but the essential patrol function is to assist the uh, city agencies in providing services uh, within our communities in and, and around our communities. Um, great, thank you. My time is up. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Bonds. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to um, very quickly. Um, Council member, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, but we have also been re rejoined by Council member Silverman. Just wanted to make you aware. I thank you. I saw your note, um, okay. but I think it's my time now. If you don't gotcha. mind. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Garrett, I wanted to know how long must the authority um, submit monthly reports to the attorney general's office as it relates to public safety measures? I believe it's a five year term. Five years? Yes. And that this is public safety concerns on throughout the um, portfolio of properties or just for a specific part of the portfolio? Well, the OAG's office identified 10 properties, um, but the, the way we are handling it, um, we're not necessarily just focusing on 10 properties. We're focusing on our whole entire portfolio. Um, we do give emphasis to those properties that have um, more have more of a, a, a crime impact or have been impacted by crime and illegal activity more. Um, but, um, you know, we don't give, we give deference to those 10 properties because those were what were identified, but we have, a, we have 41 40, 40, 41 properties to, to maintain on a daily basis. So, and yes, and, and I understand that. Go, can you talk to me about the 10 properties that you're required to report on? Um, those properties, um, I can get the list for you, but I can tell you what we do at those properties. Um, yes, I know that, that would be helpful. Um, the reality is, we, as I said earlier, we put together the, um, the, lighting, the lighting scope um, to increase lighting. Um, at, at, at the properties, we put in the camera system um, to allow for you know, more visual opportunities for crime prevention. We've also done things in terms of PM, PMO um, had to do some things also. There were a question about locks at certain um, properties where locks and doors have been broken. broken. Um, PMO, my team went in and fixed all of the locks and all the doors um, at those particular perspective 10 properties. I know Lincoln Heights was, was one of them um, that we went in and, and fixed those locks and those doors. Um, we reestablished, there was something about garbage and some other debris and different things like that. So we've established clear protocols to ensure that um, all of those things are taken care of on a daily basis. Um, and we report that out monthly to the OAG's office. Okay. Now, are any of these properties in the, um, among the 14? Yes. 
yes. properties. Yes. Which yes. properties are among the 14? Um, Alex has the list for you. I, I, I can read you the list. Um, I have it on my notes. It's um, the 10 properties are Benning Terrace, which is a transformation plan property. James Creek, which is not. Kenilworth Courts, which is not. Langston Additions and Terrace, which is a transformation plan property. Uh, LaDroit Kelly Miller, which is transformation plan. Lincoln Heights, which is not. Richardson Dwellings, which is. Uh, Stoddard Terrace, which also is a transformation plan property. And finally, Syfax Gardens in Ward 6. Okay, so I think you indicated five of the 10 are in the transformation plan. Six, six, six. of the Okay, where you're working yep. now. Correct. So you've actually doing transformation. And mm -hmm. I, I, I want to know how, how, what effect does spending resources for lighting cameras, locks on doors have towards the transformation plan? Or is there a, a cross purpose here or do they work in hand in hand? Well, I, I think we talked about it last year, and I think this is a one piece to the transformation plan with that we're calling 2.0 is the reassessment of exactly what we need to do and, and what time frame we need to do it. Um, when we first came up with the transformation plan, it was a real aggressive plan to try and get things done right away. What we realized is that we can't hit everything immediately. So there are properties where they're going to still... Um, have people remaining and living there. And their quality of life is very important to us. So those are things that we actually needed to do on behalf of those residents and their life and safety um, and health um, up to a point where we might move to a gut rehabilitation or some type of redevelopment effort. Um, those buildings and properties have to continually be maintained up until the point we make a decision that something different is going to be done. So um, I, I know it seemed, it could sound like we're spending you know, good money in, a, in, in, in the effort at the end of the day, we're gonna do something different. Um, but as long as those residents reside in those particular properties, um, it's our responsibility to take care of them. And, and I think another thing to add to that, um, if I could build on that is that the cameras and lights, um, they can be moved you know, if we end up uh, redeveloping a piece of property and 10 cameras are no longer, you know, able to be used in that location, we can take them out, put them on another site. And these are better cameras than we ever had before. These are four, what they call 4K cameras, which I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, it's the latest uh, generation of technology and they can be relocated to another site. And so it's not a wasted investment in any, in any sense of the matter, but we do need to maintain safe conditions while people live there. And if that's a matter of years, we have to make sure that people uh, live in safe conditions. Okay. And how much, um, what is the budget for this, um, for just attending to the 10 properties? For the work, the cameras and lights? Yes. Uh, it was um, just over $3 million between the two. Um, the cameras were more than the lights. The cameras, I think, were 2.9 million and the, the lights were... Uh, about 900,000, so whatever that, that's 3.8. Yes. Okay, so this is just cameras and lights, so locks on doors and anything else. What is your total budget package for securing or bringing about safety on the 10 properties? Council member, I'll have to get you the number from PMO. Mm -hmm. um, we had we brought the OCP numbers, but I'll bring I'll find the PMO numbers for locks. Um, and All usually right. that comes and usually that wasn't a special allocation. That was already in our budget, um, our basic capital capital needs budget. So okay. All right. Um. What is, what is going on on the properties as it relates to addressing the issue of food deserts? I know from time to time, my office has uh, been engaged as there have been issues of food deliveries on some properties, food deliveries like meals, uh, maybe through the um, Department of aging and community living. And then on other times, it's been um, just in general wanting to have um, this position where you can actually have bags of commodities that come to the property. What, what is, what, tell us about food on the properties. <laughs> 
Um, the, re the reality for us, council member, is that we, we have to rely on, you know, third party stakeholders um, and other agencies to support our residents in that particular effort. Um, our Office of Resident Services um, deals with that on a daily basis to ensure that properties where um, residents might be negatively impacted are taken care of. I think one of the big pieces came up during COVID um, where we were really worried about food insecurities for residents when they could not get out. So, you know, we engaged other, you know, um, other organizations to support our residents, especially in our senior buildings. And, and that's what we continue to do. Um, I, I know people believe that sometimes we can be all things, but we, we have to rely on assistance and help from, from sister agencies and organizations out there. Um, when, but we do identify issues. It could be a case by case um, situation. Um, and we put the resident in touch with the right person or the right person in touch with the resident. Okay, well, I think this is a good time to just commend you again and your um, agency and your personnel for the Herculean job that you've been doing through the pandemic. I'm sure a couple of more of my colleagues would want to thank you. I'm expecting to hear from Council Member Gray in particular. Um, he's ecstatic over the work that has been done um, with getting vaccines into um, our residents. And I'm sure we'd like us to do more. Um, and now you're moving into Ward 8. I'm, I guess uh, my colleague, Treyon White, would like to say thank you, kudos. And of course, my own council member, um, Kenyon McDuffie in Ward 5. Um, and thank you very much for all of that. Um, I know that you've also distributed, um, what is it, PPE products. And I guess you continue to do that. So we, we, we really do appreciate the way in which the authority has stepped up. Um, I, I tell my, my friends and those who wanna talk about public housing um, in particular, it is important that public housing residents understand that they are a part of the entire landscape of the city. You know, it's not like public housing over here and then we have market rate and we have rental, you know, we have rent control, but it's, we're all of us who live in the District of Columbia. And I think that your agency um, in recent times has done a lot to make that point clear. And I hope that the residents feel it as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. And I know we're not done yet, but, um, I think I'm over my time and um, Councilwoman Silverman, if you are back and have further questions. I do not, right. see, I do not see her council member. All right, well, we are at um, I have a number of questions about the vouchers. Um, I'll start and ask this one question about the um, project-based vouchers. Project-based vouchers, as we know, are attached usually to the disbursement of um, gap funding through the Housing Production Trust Fund. And so for these project-based vouchers, Tell, tell us a little bit of how that process really works. And what I'm asking is explain um, how we are able as a government to continue to subsidize the units um, over long periods of time. Well, um, council member, you make a budget allocation. That's re really what it is. Um, you understand that that um, whatever that may be, five point three million dollars in one particular year is going to be um, residual. It's going to carry over. That five point three is going to carry over into that next year um, to support those project-based units. Um, and it's for any program that we might have on our federal side. Our housing choice voucher program um, is similar. Um, with the project-based vouchers that we use for um, development projects that are out there that have been built, um, we have to budget and account for, you know, continuously supporting them because that's the big thing about affordable housing. Um, and I think Commissioner Councilmember Henderson was referring to it, um, being able to sustain the program. 
um, is very important. So um, as we move forward and talk about the number of units that we want to create, um, the one thing that we have to also always keep in mind, as you have alluded to, is being able to sustain it in those in those years. So we need to make sure we establish our clear dollar amounts of how many units that can be constructed based on that, um, based on the project based voucher um, um, funding source, um, and then go from there on an annual basis, making sure that we keep in the back of our mind, it has to be funded. Well, and I understand the budget um, um, uh, mark that we are able to um, give each um, year in each budget cycle, but I guess I'm really curious as to how and if, in fact, the authority takes into consideration um, increases in rent, um, or does the, if, if you set my rent as um, $220, and, and I have to pay the twenty dollars. And does the authority continue to pay two hundred uh, into perpetuity, you know, per month, or, or is there a gradual increase based on um, uh, the economy? Well, that's a big conversation we've been having, um, especially with the um, with the budget office and the OCFO's office about you know various things, initiatives that we're working on, especially with budget coming up. Um, we've been talking about whether or not we need to uh, you know account for inflation. Um, it's important to be able to do that uh, because residents actually themselves may change units, and in changing units, may 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 um, their voucher a dollar amount or their HAP amount may actually increase. I mean, that wasn't necessarily originally accounted for when they moved into their first particular unit, right? And they have the voucher, and, and so these are things that we need to need to consider. Um, landlords themselves, developers um, often look um, on an annual basis or every five years for some type of increase. And, and we can't be static with the dollar amount that we actually allocate. And that's just something that um, we internally know that we have to deal with. And, and we also know that with the local program, that's something that we often need to have that discussion about. Um, because there is, there is the impact of inflation and there is the impact of residents themselves moving around um, within the program. Okay, you mentioned the change of unit size. I can, I can see that. And it can be up or down. Maybe I have a voucher that does, let me just ask this then. If I have a voucher, does my voucher stipulate a two bedroom or a, a six bedroom? Yes. It does, okay. So if my, my household configuration changes and I get a new baby and a different um, gender. So now I'm no longer in a two bedroom. I would move to a three bedroom, correct? Um, not always. And I'll, uh, Carolyn is the, 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 she's the, the industry lead on this for, for us, but um, um, she can talk about the actual policies and when at what point in time a resident would be seek or could seek a new unit um, for a larger bedroom size because um, it doesn't happen automatically and immediately council member. Um, once a child is born, there are some parameters which have to be um, taken into consideration, but you are right. It, do it could fluctuate up or it could fluctuate down. And so Carolyn can be more specific for you. Um, okay. Good afternoon, Council Member Barnes. How are um, you? Yeah, so, nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. So definitely occupancy plays a role in the bedroom size per voucher. So you definitely have a size bedroom on your voucher, which can go up or down based on your household composition. Another thing that can change the amount of contract rent we pay is where you move in, in the city because we have sub markets. So each sub market is different. Each submarket has a different um, cost, of, you know, associated with the actual bedroom sizes. So there are various um, things that come into play as it relates to the contract rent per voucher. Okay, and then um, you mentioned that the landlord can make a request, um, can say that, well, you know, this person has been here, this resident has been here for six years. When do I get a cost of living increase? Do you honor it like that or are there other kinds of regulations that would come into play? 
Right. So in general, our regulations provide that um, 90 days outside of the actual household recertification period, a request for a rent increase can occur. And what we do with that, we make sure you're in compliance. So there are no HQS or housing quality standard inspection issues. And then we can move from there. But we do, we have to buy by our regulations. And as it stands right now, we use HUD's annual adjustment factor of 1.02% as it relates to an increase. Okay. And um, you mentioned... <clears throat> you mentioned the requirement to do an inspection. Is that is that required every two years or every year or just when you want to change your lease arrangement? So inspections happen definitely at the initial lease up. So that's when you have been deemed eligible and you are going to move into your first unit. We do inspections based on complaints. So that can happen at any time, a complaint from the tenant or a complaint from the landlord. And then we do biennial every two year inspections um, is what we have pivoted to. That is the actual standard now in the nation. Prior to even like a year to a year and a half ago, we were doing annual inspections every year. But again, we're pivoting to the biennial inspections. You know, I have a question about the inspections as it relates to access to the premises. Uh, one of the complaints in another type of housing that the city has regulation over is the access to the units and um, tenants um, not making the unit available for inspections. Do you have that problem? And if so, how, what do your regulations say? Yes, we do have that problem. Um, there are instances where we definitely have an inspection schedule and you know we have pivoted to the virtual inspections. So even in that instance, we have a proxy inspector um, on the other end of we use a device similar to what we're using now like WebEx or Zoom um, to conduct the inspection. But even with the in-person inspections, when we were doing them, you go to the home of the actual tenant. If the tenant doesn't let us in, that is actually, that's an issue and that's a violation of your obligations in the voucher program. So we'll reschedule and we will uh, make another attempt. You definitely are aware that we're coming and we, again, try to assess the unit and complete the inspection. And if that's, the, again, a second time we've come out, then we can actually recommend you for termination from the program um, because you're not abiding by your actual family obligations. You should let us in and also your landlord in for their routine maintenance. All right. Thank you very, no, thank you very much for the, those responses. You're welcome. <clears throat> and we are um, nearly at the end of our time frame for this um, session. I see another colleague has reappeared. So I will ask um, Council Member White, are you here for this? portion or are you here for the second hearing? I'm here for this portion, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. Well, go uh, right ahead. Thank you. And uh, let, let me be uh, expeditious uh, since I know you have to move on. Uh, Director Garrett, let me, let me start with where I, I left off on uh, the lead pain issue um, or the, the lead issue rather. Uh, so what, what is uh, D DCHA done and what, what will you do to check that interim controls are, are lasting and that the paint doesn't um, uh, quickly deteriorate. So I know that the interim controls, sometimes you will paint over lead paint or, or, or something like that. How, how do you make sure those uh, fixes last? Well, the, the, way it's, the way it's working for us now, I, I can't talk to how, how it might have been done in the past, but my managers in my maintenance department, they go into the units on an annual basis. The manager goes into the unit to make sure that nothing is wrong. And if the maintenance department goes into the unit um, to perform a routine work order, they check the unit also at the same time. In addition, annual inspections are going to be done um, within those units, especially with the interim controls to make sure that they've held. That's a responsibility and obligation of the authority to do that. So... Um, that's part of our that's part of our overall plan okay and the uh, do, do you uh, document when uh, reinspections are, are done yes sir okay 
The, so I, I do understand that uh, during the pandemic, you've stopped conducting interim controls and, and abatement measures. Does that include, you, you also don't do those on any vacant units? Um, at a point in time, we had stopped doing them on vacant units also, uh, only because it required employees to gather in a particular unit. Um, that was something that we had been discussing. I discussed with my director of PMO um, just a few days ago about turning vacant units also. Um, Sending one person in at a time would not be efficient. They usually go in as teams to do painting and different things like that. So um, we're, we're hoping that, you know, at the end of the pandemic, we'll come very soon and we'll be able to get back into the un those units to do, you know, whatever it may be in terms of an interim control. Um, and okay. also we required in some instances, council member, it also required relocation of residents. That's a piece of the puzzle that I'm not sure if everyone's aware of. Uh, Park Morton is an example where we did interim controls there and we had to actually physically relocate residents into hotels. So there's another aspect of the interim control Control that's just not about us going into a particular unit. Um, it also involves residents themselves gathering belongings and moving into the hotels for you know three to five days at at at, at times. Yeah, no, and we we don't want to promote any unnecessary moving. Uh, if they are necessary, then uh, you know we may have to do that. But but we don't want to promote any unnecessary moving. Um, so one issue I want to raise that just came on my radar when I was in another meeting was a, uh, an article that, that came out today uh, raising concerns about uh, two, two contracts with uh, McKinsey and company, one for a strategic uh, plan that the article says the, the agency didn't receive. Can, can you tell us what, the, what this is about and what the status is? I haven't, I haven't read the I haven't read the article, so I don't know exactly what it what it's referring to and referencing. I know that our, our general counsel is looking into um, some work that was performed by an outside um, audit firm, um, and he's he and his team are identifying whether or not it is actually a final audit of any sorts um, and how it actually originated and whether or not it needed to be done. So um, I don't have any facts to offer to you right now about that particular about that particular article. Um, I myself haven't read it and I'm not sure what it states. Okay, what was uh, McKinsey and Company contracted by, by the agency to, to do a strategic plan? Yes, they, they were, they were. And, and did they do a strategic plan? I think they, they did. You know, the one thing that I talk about is our transformation plan. They had a major role in helping us create that. We needed validation. Um, we, remember when we were talking about the $2.2 .2 billion, we were talking about transformation and all these needs. We needed an organization that had um, experience um, at putting something like that together and helping organizations, government organizations like ours, um, translating that into, you know, layman's terms and getting people to, to, to understand exactly what we were actually facing. So our transformation plan is actually our strategic plan um, in of itself. Okay. And, and that is uh, in accordance with what you contracted McKinsey and company for? Um, we believe it is. Okay. Um, will, will you, um, report back any developments on this to the committee? Yes, I will. Thank you. I want to move to uh, redevelopment and uh, rehab and maintenance. Obviously, uh, I know that, that you're committed to allowing tenants to return to properties once redevelopments occur, uh, but do we put that in writing uh, for residents that they have a right to return? It's actually in each relocation plan that we have to submit to HUD. So I know that we've been talking about other ways to document it, whether it be a board resolution or something like that. But when we submit a relocation plan to HUD and it's approved, we actually write into that plan the relocation opportunities for residents to the right for residents to return. It's written there. So that's one place that we document um, their right to return. And okay. it has but to be approved by HUD. But it, saying it to HUD and saying it to the residents is, is different. Um, and we do, and I'm sorry, we do tell them, we do explain it to them. If we need to develop other means um, to give them assurances, we can figure out ways to do that. I, I don't know what it looks like. It may be some type of, you know, agree, written agreement between, you know, individual agreement between residents, but um, I can have my general counsel's office look at, you know, what other ways can we assure residents that they have that opportunity? Okay. Um, the, you, um, you, you mentioned the, the, uh, just now the uh, transformation plan, which I think is called Transformation 2.0. Um, can, can you talk about what exactly that will in include and uh, particularly what, what you describe as policy issues regarding resident rights and concerns and revisions to property by property recommendations uh, based on uh, engagement with, with residents? 
Well, it, it goes back to the, the big thing that you're talking about. One thing that we were falling short on was actual what we believe was engagement and everyone understanding what our me, what our goal was. You know, our goal was to put residents in safe housing a, a, as soon as possible. Um, one other piece to the puzzle, our transformation plan 2.0 shifts is that we start talking about those make ready units, those units that uh, we want to turn around so that we can do a consolidation on site. That's something that we had not contemplated originally um, in the transformation plan and integrate engaging with residents and also engaging with the advocate community. Um, we took a step back and, and reassessed exactly how we needed to approach this. So in some cases, um, uh, be, before you jump back on, we were talking with council member, member bonds about, you know, the, the need to do, you know, maintenance on properties that might have, um, that we might never be able to get to within the quote unquote transformation plan for a few years. Um, and that's something that we had to take into consideration because again, I started right out the gate being very aggressive in my approach to try and get things done because I felt as though it was necessary and needed for the safety and well being of the families. But my team um, being the team that they are and, and, and the capable in, individuals with the agency, you know, we stepped back and we talked about it again and we said, hey, these are things that we actually need to do to effectuate this. So um, for us, the ability to actually leverage um, district dollars in order to get us to the point where we can do transformational um, activities and full redevelopments or full gut rehabs at particular properties um, is something that this new transformation um, plan does. I, I'm not going to call it new, but the the revision, the, the shift, and look, that look. all comes from that. And again, I'm sorry to be long-winded on it, but that all comes from input from residents, um, the concerns and uh, residents and advocates, the concerns that they raise to us. I appreciate that. The, um, I, I want to talk really quickly um, about uh, the, the the funds for uh, for, for for rehab and, and maintenance, uh, and I see that you spent almost all of the FY19 r and funds and looks like you've obligated most of the FY20 funds. When, when can we expect that the majority of projects with obligated funds will begin? Um, they've actually already begun. begun. Um, for fiscal year 20, um, for the $39.8 million, we actually have 89% of the pro projects under construction right now. Um, and that, that equates to about $35 million. Okay. And what's the, what's the timeline between um, when the council passes the budget and your ability to begin any projects that, uh, that are going to be funded with, with those funds. We try to prime the pump, so to speak. We try to get ready and prepare for the day that you, um, you know, the October, October one date hits. Um, and we start, you know, sending over information and documents over to the OCFO's office, probably within 30 to 45 days uh, of the, of the fiscal year. Okay. Um, with my remaining seconds, there are a couple other larger issues I wanted to dig into, but, but, but I'm running out of time and, and do want to be respectful. So I can send those later. Uh, but one other question. Um, it, so HUD, HUD requires public housing authorities to allow pets in public housing unless the local housing agency has uh, obtained an exemption in its uh, moving to work plan. Uh, looks like HUD revoked DCHA's exemption in February 2016, but that DCHA only allows pets and housing for the elderly and disabled. Uh, why is that? And is that something that you're, you're open to allowing? Uh, safety concerns. Um, if, are you saying why we allow it for the seniors and disabled or? Well, why, why not allow it more broadly? And it, it does, the policy seems to be out of line with HUD's policy. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult in some cases to enforce. And I'll give you an example. We just had a case where a resident had a dog, um, a vicious dog, what we consider to be a vicious dog. Um, by breed or by action? By both. <laughs> uh, there's no vicious well, breed. I, mean, well, I shouldn't say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say both. You're, you're absolutely correct. It depends upon the, 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 the owner and how the, how the dog is, is, is taken care of. You're absolutely right, because I've had dogs myself. Um, so this particular by action, um, hurt someone um, and harm someone. And I can tell you across the board um, within the housing authorities throughout the nation, there are certain, um, unfortunately, um, council member, and I can tell you you're, you're a, a dog lover, unfortunately, um, housing authorities have put restrictions on, you know, certain types of dogs. It's, it's unfortunate, I understand, but um, it's hard for us to police at times. So if it's something that you want us to revisit and look at, we can, we can definitely do that. Um, but I do know that there, there is a associated liability and, uh, uh, associated liability that goes along with uh, allowing pets um, and trying to monitor and police it. 
I appreciate it. Uh, I do have some interest in this and I'll, I'll follow up with you, uh, Director and uh, Council Member Boss. Thank you for, for being generous with, with these rounds. And uh, uh, Director Garrett, to you and your team, thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you very much, um, Council Member White. I have one last um, question that I want to make sure we put on the record. Um, could you please um, discuss the authority's section three engagement? And that is the program that requires recipients of certain HUD financial assistance to the greatest extent possible, provide training, employment, contracting, and other economic development to low and very low income persons, especially recipients of government assistance for housing and to businesses that provide economic opportunities to low and very low income persons. In other words, this section of, of the HUD law, can you? Yeah, it's pretty pretty straightforward, Council Member, as you just stated it. Any contract that we we bring on board, um, we obligate that particular contractor or vendor um, to work with us by, you know, if it's depending upon what type of service it is. If it's a professional service, um, we ask that they give workshops to our, our residents about um, resume writing or, you know, how to prepare for a job interview, different things like that. Or in some cases, offering opportunities as an internship or working within the office. If it's a construction um, opportunity, um, we ask that we individuals have by by rule have to work on site, right? They have to become um, laborers or they have to work in some capacity on a redevelopment project. And that's required by rule um, through section three. And we require that for anyone that we're inter engaging with. Um, it does vary depending upon the service, uh, but it's something that we're very strong about. Um, and we, we enforce that. I, I think I recall um, one of your um, commissioners, one of your uh, parties to the governance of the um, agency uh, being a contractor. I think Mr. Gard indicated that he um, does uh, flooring and he is very excited about the programs that he has um, implemented with public housing residents. Um, Tell us, is that the only program that you know of within the authority? Well, I think he might have been talking about his separate program. We we do, you know, we do multiple programs. We also have a, a economic inclusion policy um, that that we we follow through on, and that's really to try and be very very hard hitting in terms of development opportunities that may come to the authority to ensure that we have residents participating um, in whatever economic development opportunity that is presented to us. Um, our apprentice program is not quote unquote a Section Three program, but it is similar to that because we also try to place those individuals who finish with that program or graduate from that program with various vendors, various contractors that we may work with on an on a, on a annual basis. Okay. Since your tenure with the authority, um, uh, how many um, vendors do you work with? Um, I'm sure you maintain a list of individuals that can do elevator repair, a list that do, does roofing and what have you. Yes, That's we keep, the list I'm speaking of. Yes, we keep a list. I don't know how many people are, how many vendors are on the actual list. I can get it for you, but we do keep a list of that within our um, OCP department. Okay. I'm particularly, yes, I would like to um, have access to that list. Um, and um, it would be wonderful if, you off, if your office has done an analysis that would somehow um, inform us as to those, the uh, amount of work or contract value that any of those um, vendors have received and those that are DC based businesses. Yes. And so we'll wait a little longer for that information, um, maybe by the 1st of May. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Well, we are going to conclude um, this portion of our um, discussion with um, Mr. Garrett at this time. And I wanna thank everyone who participated in today's um, hearing. Um, the next meeting we will be doing and momentarily um, scheduled to begin as close to 3 p.m. today as possible. We will continue having discussions with um, Mr. Garrett and to learn more about the um, District of Columbia Housing Authority as it conducts um, 
its um, local rent supplement program, particularly geared to our most vulnerable um, citizens, primarily those that are in our homeless um, community. Um, and we'll be doing that um, hearing with the Committee on Human Services. And so, Mr. Garrett, we're going to give you uh, 10 minutes to refresh yourself. Uh, okay. So it is now, the hour is now 2.52. So we will begin again at 3.05 okay. uh, p.m. in all fairness. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, council members. I appreciate it. So we're recessed until then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.